mixed cannulae, expanding performance standards. High performance cannulae for direct and femoral cannulation in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Levanova's complete range of mixed dedicated products allow easy and reproducible procedures. The portfolio includes the sutureless aortic valve Percival, Memo 4D for mitral valve repair. The HeartLink system for assisting the perfusionist in applying goal-directed perfusion therapy. And a broad choice of high-performance dedicated cannulae. Leva Nova's range of cannulae suit every cannulation technique for minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Venous and arterial femoral cannulation can be performed using the wrap venous cannula and the Easy Flow Duo. For arterial direct and venous femoral cannulation, the Easy Flow aortic cannula and the wrap are available. For venous femoral access, the Levanova wrap cannula features a dual stage configuration for optimal drainage of the inferior and superior vena cava without interfering with the right atrium. The high flow dynamics of wrap improves the capability of drainage with a low pressure drop. An optional Selinger dilator kit is available to perform percutaneous insertion. The Levanova Easy Flow Duo Cannula is designed for a safe and smooth femoral arterial cannulation. Its conical dispersion tip design allows a more gentle flow in the femoral artery, and its red cap avoids blood backflow during obturator removal. A dilator kit for percutaneous insertion is also included with the cannula. Easy Flow cannulae are designed for safe, reproducible, direct aortic cannulation and include a malleable stylet to aid cannulation insertion, facilitating bloodless introduction into the aortic arch, as well as a special conical dispersion tip for a more gentle flow in the vessel to reduce shear stress. The point of care program at Huntsville Hospital is approaching its 20 year anniversary. As we began to grow as a hospital and provide more complex services to our community, the need for point of care testing became very clear in our organization. Many of our departments consider the EPOT device to be crucial to their ability to quickly move their patients from entry to the hospital to procedural room. It helps them monitor the patient's status during their procedures and post-procedure, so it's very integrated into our entire continuum of patient care. If you have any patient population where blood management is crucial, then a point of care device is very useful in those types of settings. It can provide a quick result on a very small amount of blood and, and that is really important in some of our patient population. We are starting a new process where we're going to screen our patients on the floor for sepsis. The patient can look and, and actually feel okay. They will show us signs and symptoms of sepsis. So what we do when they show these signs, we get a lactate level. Lactic acid is a, a product of the sepsis cascade. So with sepsis, the inflammatory light switch goes on, the cascade starts churning, and unfortunately, once it starts going, we have to stop it. It will not stop on its own. The faster the lab draw, the faster the lab results, and the faster you can, you can act on it. The process in the lab is what the process is. It just takes a certain amount of time for the instruments to run those tests. I mean, we're talking 30 minutes even on a stat because that's the process. You, this is how long it takes. There's not really anything you can do about that. For every hour you wait to give an antibiotic, the mortality for that patient increases 8%. So now that we have the handheld device, the nurse can get those results within a few minutes and we know how to treat that patient. If a patient is going into septic shock, we do not have minutes to spare. We have got to get it done quickly. So when you get the little beep from the epoch that says your results are in, you're, you go with it. You don't even think twice about it. You're like, this is, this is good. This is what I'm going to do for this patient. The next steps are clear. I think our mortality on the, the initial floors dropped by almost 50% in the first three to six months. 
At this point, we are about hospital-wide. I think we'll be hospital-wide another two to four months. So this has become a huge program uh, within our, our system. Without the Epoch device, it would really be hard for us to get everything done in the timely manner. So it's really helped us to get our program going. I mean, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a medicine doctor, whether you're a dermatologist, you want to be able to do things in a timely fashion so that you can be most effective. This really makes a difference in patient outcomes. Like all perfusion professionals today, we are busy and frequently short-staffed. Does taking time off for a conference create a burden for your teammates? Has reimbursement for your continuing education dropped? Have you priced the cost of going to a meeting lately? Registration fees, airfare, transportation and parking, hotel, and meals out? This totals up to having an out-of-pocket expense of over $2,500 and then you hope the content is good. Perfusion Education has heard your concerns. They have a simple and seamless system that works on any platform, computer, tablet, or even your phone. You can chat during the program or even phone in and be live on the air. The content, second to none. Perfusion Education is by Perfusionist and for Perfusionist. Create a free account and check us out today. And good afternoon, colleagues. How are y'all doing today? Uh, I'm Joe Basha, your host of PerfWeb, Perfusion Education, and uh, we're welcoming you here today. Thankful that you're here, appreciate you. Uh, first, go through my housekeeping notes, please, like I do every day, every, every show we do. Thank our sponsors, Levanova and Siemens Diagnostics. Please check them out. They're very generous to us, and uh, we can't bring you this kind of programming without them. Uh, and some of our future program is going to be awesome, okay? I'm going to tell you right now. Social media, like us, follow us, share us. Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and also give us that thumbs up. We need 100 million new subscribers before the end of the show tonight. So that's a lot. So you, need to get, you need to get on it, okay? And subscribe. Call your friends, your family, get your kids an account, whatever you need to do, subscribe. Uh, check out our website. If you'd like to be on our program as a faculty member or you would like to do a case report, maybe uh, talk about, just have a discussion, any of those things, any and all above. Or if you'd like to, of course, uh, if you're an industry person, would like to be a sponsor, reach out to us at contact.perfusioneducation.com. The email address is right there. We will get back to you. We had some great callers the other night. Uh, we had uh, somebody Facebooking, uh, messaging us from Portugal. We've had somebody from Argentina. We had somebody from Saudi Arabia call in. We had a call in from California. And I'm making new, fr you know, this is hard going to meetings you have that interaction face to face with people but of course that's kind of on hold right now and we all have to sort of accept that i do think live meetings have to come back and we are going to bring the new orleans conference back i'm just letting you all know in advance um in in a new form but it's going to be great okay because everything we do is great that's just the way it is uh but uh, uh i think that online education is critically important and we're finding more and more we're building a community of people and we are going to find a way to bring us all together so that uh, we, can, we can really get to know each other. And I think it's gonna, we can do this virtually. We're gonna figure all of this out. Uh, our call-in number, when you see this, phone lines are open, dial that number and you can be live on the air and ask your question, make a comment, whatever it may be. All right, I wanna introduce everyone to one of our uh, absolute strongest faculty members and somebody who's become a dear friend of mine. And we actually became friends off of this program. So John Ingram, uh, a, a, a true colleague, a, a truly experienced perfusionist, somebody who's a master at his craft, uh, very, very smart. You're working right now on your, on your master's, right? Is it master's or PhD? 
Well, it's going to be both. It's going to be both. I get done. So you're working. So you're still at. So you're still finishing your master's up. Then you're going to go to your PhD, and mm-hmm. that's just outstanding, dude. I'm so proud of you for doing that. And uh, you know, I don't mean this in a in a, in a not so nice way, but. At, you know, at your age, the fact that you're still doing things, I still, I think, gives a lot of people hope that there's life after, after Geritol. So I don't know if you remember Geritol or not, but, you know, for those of you who don't know what Geritol is, you can look it up. All right. Um, but John is going to be, I'm going to be talking about deep hypothermia circulatory arrest. And I'm only going to mention about pH stat and alpha stat. And then John is going to, in his presentation, elaborate significantly on those two that con those concepts of acid base management ph and alpha stat when it comes to deep hypothermia circulatory arrest because that's a topic unto itself my topic i I would have to give a two and a half hour lecture to cover it all john it's just too much information frankly um so uh with that said i'm gonna just go ahead and dive right into my slides john if you see something you want to stop me you want to ask me a question you want to make a comment don't hesitate to just interrupt okay because i think we do that with each other very well there's a lot of a lot of strong synergy between each other and uh so don't hesitate to do that all right sounds good cool all right or if you see somebody ask a question on the youtube whatever it might be all right so my talk is on deep hypothermia circulatory arrest perfusing and protecting specifically the brain all right now you have the whole body to be concerned about and i'll discuss that a little bit but really i'm focusing on the brain what are the indications well deep hypothermia is most commonly used in elective complex aortic arch surgery where it is impossible to perfuse the brain through cerebral vessels using a standard CPB cannulation technique. DHCA or deep hypothermic circulatory arrest is also commonly employed in acute type A aortic dissections. And these are typically emergencies. These are typically cases we don't, we, we enjoy them when they're over and they're successful, but we dread them Uh, Getting that call usually at 10 or 11 o'clock at night is usually when it occurs. So these are my old slides. Can you put up my new slides? These aren't the ones I sent you. Okay. Hey, everybody, can can we take a two minute break? John, we can just talk while they pull up the right slides because it's it's not the right slide deck. Sorry for that delay. Let's see. So, John, how's the weather down in Orlando? You know, today we have a cold front. Yeah, that's not it. It's really strange. And uh, we just don't have cold snaps come through this time of year. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very strange. This morning Mm -hmm. it was uh, probably in the the low 60s, Mm -hmm. which us is cold. (laughs) Really? What's the temperature? Let me see what the third slide on that looks like. Or you have to go to we, we transfer and, and look. Well, it's funny what you were saying because that type A dissection, there's never a good time to hear that. <laughs> no, there never is. There's no, never a good time to hear that. Never a good time to hear it. Never. No. Nope. Nope. That's when your when your your heart just sinks when you get that when you get that call. That's it. Now we got him. Yeah, I remember. I remember the worst. The worst day of my life. We did three of them in a row, wow. and it was excruciatingly painful. And it started on a Friday, early evening, and then kept on going all the way until Saturday, late at night. And uh, I joked with the, the surgeon. I called up and said that. Uh, because uh, it was another, it was the emergency room that they had another one, and uh, he just he just was beside himself. And of course, I was too, but I was making it up. I had somebody call from outside the room, and I was like, "Well, it's not really April's Fools, man." He was mad. He was hot. He was hot. Okay, let me go back to my slides here. Okay, so these are the this is the CT that you get, and you look at it and you go, "Uh, I know this is not going to be a good day." And uh, in this case, you actually have a left main dissection 
uh, as the entrant point. Uh, so that's a really bad one, you know, because now you've got to deal with that as well. But frequently it is above the aortic valve and, and you can just replace that ascending section of the aorta. Uh, and this is kind of a, a, a diagrammatic representation of what you saw in that CT of being the true lumen and the false lumen and seeing the flap and you see the line that's sort of separating the two and it gives you an idea of what it looks like from a from a diagrammatic perspective and this is the horrible on the left what you see and uh, you see all of the the blood that's in the false lumen, it's dark and it's probably clotted by now and uh, it looks, it's really bad. A lot of times with these patients, you open the pericardium up and you see blood in there too. But then on the right side, you see obviously what is the repair and, uh, and so forth. So, you know, and, that, and that's to people that do this for a living, that makes a lot of sense to people who don't do this for a living, they really don't know what they're looking at. But when you see that on the left, you know, it's, it, there's a high pucker factor associated with that. So I wanted to put this diagram up because I think it really helps to illustrate why doing these kinds of cases are so difficult. And I just, I, I took this diagram from online. And if you look, you'll notice that the heart is kind of missing, right? There's the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava. You don't see the heart. And there's the aorta right there. So in normal bypass, the aortic cannula is put in somewhere in the aorta around here, just above the heart, and it perfuses the head vessels, and it perfuses down the body into all the organs and all that kind of stuff. But now they're going to cannulate down here in the femoral artery, and they're going to come up here, and they're going to cut this part of the aorta off and then they're going to cut the part of the aorta off that has where the dissection started. So between the aortic valve and this spot, it's going to be wide open. Well, there's no access to clamp here. And if you did, your femoral artery is only gonna still just perfuse up to that point. And you still have to worry about the head. And so if you see the arch vessels, there is the innominate and you have the the uh, right carotid and then you have the left carotid coming up over here but i really want you to take note of how you have the jugular vein coming down and intersecting into this and all of these vessels are connected way up here in the head by the capillary system now we think about it we give antegrade and retrograde cardioplegia all of the time if you have multi-vessel disease with tight lesions, giving antegrade cardioplegia doesn't do you a lot of good uh, because you can't get the cardioplegia distributed. So you need to give it retrograde. When you do aortic valves, if you wanna do, uh, uh, you have, either have to use direct coronary perfusers or you can give it retrograde and you actually see the cardioplegia coming out of the coronary sinuses. So, so perfusing retrograde will work in the heart it will also work in the brain. So if it's going up the normal circulation, up the aorta and through the arterial system, it's antegrade. If it's going up the retrograde uh, direction through the venous system, it will make its way through the brain and come back, draining back to the arterial system. So I just wanted to, even though it's very rudimentary for a lot of my colleagues, I still wanted to point that out because I think this diagram really explains very well what it is we're trying to do. So what are the other indications? Well, congenital aortic arch surgery, uh, patients that have, let's call, let's say it's a porcelain aorta, pulmonary thromboendarterectomy is very common, uh, and that's a big operation requiring uh, deep hypothermic circulatory arrest. Tumors invading the vena cava, especially renal cell carcinoma tumors, can be a real difficult thing to clear out without uh, circulatory arrest. Complex uh, AV malformations, gigantic cerebral aneurysms and surgery to head and neck vessels. So there's various different reasons, but my focus is really on type one dissections because those are the cases, because most of the time, if you're gonna get a case, you're not gonna do a, a, a procedure that is planned 
from a congenital deformity or something like that at a community hospital, they're gonna go to a medical center or be referred to one that does aortic surgery all the time. What you're gonna get are type one dissections. That's what you're gonna get. So what is the conduct of perfusion for deep hypothermic circulatory arrest? You gotta do a really good pre-op assessment. You want, a, you want to figure out your cannulation strategy. For CPB, femoral arterial return and a standard venous, or do you want to use a VFEM type of thing and a, do a femoral venous cannulation? Either one will work um, and work fine. I prefer they put just a big right atrial IVC cannulin, double, uh, a, a double uh, 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 basketed uh, system or two, two port drain system to really get good drainage because I don't want the heart stuffed at, it, at any time. And then add an extra SVC line. I like a 22 French and you have to make sure, and I'll show it to you later, where they put tapes around it. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Or if you're gonna do antegrade, then you put a graft to the axillary artery. Now, I don't think I don't like antegrade, I prefer retrograde, and I'm gonna to try to make a case for that during this presentation. Also, temperature management is of utmost importance. It has to be at least two sites. I personally prefer the bladder and esophageal, but you can use the rectal, you can use the nasopharyngeal, but I strongly discourage nasopharyngeal. That's why I put a line through it, because I think that can be altered and be inaccurate based on a lot of other factors, including ambient air and other factors like that. I just don't think it's deep enough. So cooling and arrest, venous return and arterial outflow gradient should not exceed 10 degrees centigrade. Packing the head in ice or using a head cooling device, they have those, um, is also very helpful to keep from convectively warming it up, depending on the room temperature and what's going on at the time. Use of neuroprotective pharmacologic uh, agents need to be given before circulatory arrest for obvious reasons. You can't circulate it if, you don't, if you're on circ arrest. So you really need to make sure you time these things properly. And cooling shouldn't be done in a hurry. Cooling should take time because you want to make sure you get very even cooling of the brain and the surrounding tissue, which will eventually start to distribute heat back into the brain where you don't want it to be. So having that brain really at the right temperature is going to make an enormous difference. Some of the pharmacological neuroprotective uh, strategies that we have are of course sodium pentothal or thiopental decreases cerebral blood flow, however. It has myocardial depressive effect and it can be responsible for delayed wakening. So you have to remember that. Now it will lower the, the uh, cerebral metabolic rate for oxygen significantly, just like propofol will, but it has those other uh, side effects. It does decrease CBF. So does propofol. It also decreases cerebral blood flow. But the evidence as to whether these pharmacologic adjuncts to cerebral protection actually work is lacking. And so you have to sort of use your judgment there. I think it still makes sense, but you know, I like the old sodium pentothal. It worked. We had very good success with it. Um, when you use, uh, when you use corticosteroids um, to control inflammation, which it does very well, uh, you have much more difficulty with glycemic control because it causes the blood sugar to go up. Volatile agents uh, such as your, uh, what we talked about yesterday with the desflurane and your, uh, your anesthetic gas on the pump, those actually increase the, uh, 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 I'm sorry, decrease the cerebral metabolic rate for oxygen. So those are very good for neuroprotection, your volatile anesthetics. They decrease the CMRO2. So let's take a look at these in a little more depth if we can. Cerebral blood flow, so volatile agents, cause a dose-dependent increase 
in CBF due to vasodilatation, and that's going to include every, all of the things, halothane, desflurane, isoflurane, and sevoflurane, okay? Your cerebral metabolic rate for oxygen with volatile anesthetics decrease and you will have luxurious perfusion, a state where cerebral blood flow is greater than the requirement. The exception to this, very important, is nitrous oxide because it leads to an increased cerebral blood flow, but also an, in, in, an increased O2 requirement for the brain. IV anesthetics, they will decrease cerebral blood flow, they will decrease cerebral metabolic rate, they, uh, with the exception of ketamine that increases cerebral blood flow and increases this, the, uh, the uh, cerebral metabolic rate for oxygen. Benzos, you can read that there. Opioids, essentially no effect. And non-depolarizing neuromuscular blockades, you can also see there what's going on there. Succinylcholine, it says, is controversial, and uh, I, you know, I don't know too many people that still use sucks. So what is the optimal temperature and duration of deep hypothermia circulatory rest? Well, really when you take all of the information that's out there, between 18 and 20 degrees Celsius is considered optimal. And this is derived from looking at all the studies that I was able to find, and also all my own experience. Studies on pigs have shown that even at a core temperature of eight degrees Celsius, however, cerebral metabolic rate for oxygen still remains at eight to 11% baseline. That's very impressive. And I do believe that holds true for humans. Despite isoelectric EEG, oxygen consumption still occurs. Analysis of the data at 18 to 20 degrees Celsius, 40 minutes is probably safe. And that's a big probably. I've done probably, um, I don't know, I, I've done a few hundred uh, uh, type A dissections or type 1 dissections uh, uh, in my career. And of the ones that did well, they all had retrograde cerebral perfusion. Of the ones that did not do well, all of those were done without selective cerebral perfusion, just clamp and go. So I come from a time when that was something that would happen. Um, and even at 18 degrees, the outcomes were still not great. So I am, even though it says 40 minutes is probably safe, at 30 minutes, you know, what does safe really mean? And uh, the outcomes were never good. The only time it's ever been really effective and where I feel like the outcomes were consistent with what we expect the patient to do well, um, 18 degrees is what I like to be at. And I like to have adjunct isolated cerebral perfusion, preferably retrograde, which I've said a thousand times, I know. Beyond 40 minutes, the incidence of stroke and neurologic deficit markedly rise. And I'm sure there's injury occurring even before that. So this is a very good slide. If you look at the blue line, let's see if I can get this to work. Yeah. I'll just talk about it. So if you look at the cerebral metabolic rate at 100% of baseline, and you look at the temperature straight down, you see it's 35 to 37 degrees, somewhere around there. There it goes. There it goes. That's working now. So right there. There you go. So there's your 100% at that temperature right there. And then you watch as the temperature decreases going from right to left, and you see your cerebral metabolic rate decreasing as the temperature goes down. But you never see it, there's, there's, no, there's nothing that's gonna take it to zero. And you look over here at the safe HCA time, as your temperature is increasing going from left to right, and there's your time on this side, you see it's going down, 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 down. So these are very important this is a very important graph to have, and there are documented uh, actual numbers that you can use 
uh, and have, in fact, we have an app that's going to be coming out soon that's going to have actual temperatures of safe circulatory rest time. Now, these times, keep in mind, are assuming no adjunctive selective cerebral perfusion. Again, I don't feel I don't, I, I, I would want to go someplace that was going to try to perfuse my brain selectively. They, they're laughing over there. Um, thanks. Um, selectively, if I had a type A dissection. So glucose and hematocrit management on these cases. Hyperglycemia is associated with poorer outcomes, and that's even on heart cases. We know that. Uncontrolled hyperglycemia is bad. Hyperglycemia is common during deep hypothermia. CPB-induced inflammatory mediators mediate insulin resistance. Hypothermia results in a decrease in the release of insulin. So you get a decreased release and a resistance that is secondary to the inflammatory process that takes place. Corticosteroids, as I said earlier, commonly we use them for neuroprotection, further exacerbate this hyperglycemia. So we use them for inflammatory mediator uh, me, uh, mitigation and uh, neuroprotective maneuvers, and of course, it further uh, makes managing hyperglycemia more difficult. We should have them on an insulin drip, insulin pump, and keep their uh, glucoses below 100 milligrams per deciliter. That's the data from the uh, from the textbooks and uh, various different articles. Hematocrit and blood viscosity during DHCA. When the blood temperature is decreased, this is a fascinating fact is decreased from 36.5 to 22 degrees C, blood viscosity increases by 26.13%. According to Poisset equation, we all know Poisset from Perfusion School, of course, the blood flow rate decreases 20.72%. There's a 34, 35% decrease in erythrocyte deformability. Remember, it has to get through the capillaries and the capillaries are five microns. The red blood cells are seven microns. They got to squeeze through. So they can't squeeze through if they won't deform. Kind of the same thing you see with old blood from the blood bank. Um, and about 19% increase in plasma viscosity. And these things will result in microcirculatory perfusion derangements, deficits, whatever you want to call it. I would love to use my dark field side stream scanner on some deep hypothermia cases to see what happens to the microcirculation as we're cooling the patient. I haven't had the opportunity to do it yet, but that would be an incredibly fascinating uh, uh, study to do. Uh, if I had an animal, somebody out there watching has the idea of using a microvascular, a, a, a microvascular camera and has an animal lab that can do this, I will come to you and we can do this. Just share the imaging with me so that I can do a program on it or come on the program and do it yourself. So what about neurologic monitoring? We do that too. Well, there's the EEG, we're kind of used to that. And then there's the somatosensory uh, evoke potentials. There's those two different kinds. Um, there's oximetry, which you can measure the jug jugular bulb uh, or jugular venous bulb oxygen saturation, which is kind of like a like a like the uh, the Rivers catheter that is in the superior vena cava, um, as just above the uh, the uh, the abdominal. Um, and it measures the, the, the basically this, the saturation of the venous return saturation coming from the top of the body, which just uses more oxygen. Um, and in some centers, depth of anesthesia monitoring could use the BIS monitoring, but it's unclear how to interpret these values in the context of DHCA. I don't think the BIS monitor, I think it's very good for knowing if your patient is um, under anesthesia and under a certain number where the likelihood of having uh, uh, any kind of awareness or recall is diminished to a point of, of, of acceptability. For this, I don't think the BIS monitor makes any sense given how the BIS monitor works. But what are the advantages and limitations? Well, EEG, you can read the advantages and you can read the disadvantages. The uh, uh, somatosensory 
uh, evoked potential. You can see its advantages and its disadvantages. The jugular bulb, uh, SJO2, you know, that's kind of makes sense because if you use retrograde cerebral perfusion, it's going to be great. Um, but I think it would be a good tool for standard cardiopulmonary bypass to know what your upper body SVO2 was. And then you have NEARS, of course, which is the, um, the uh, 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 what do you call it? The, the, the so what do you call that thing, John? Do you remember? They have several of them out there. The uh, infrared infrared spectroscopy, but they have yeah. the uh, the four four the foresight. Yeah, there's foresight. The, uh, the, near, the other one is called the NEARS, isn't it? Um, no, I don't know. I don't remember. There's foresight and something else, Casmet or something. I don't Cas know. Casmet, but uh, yeah. but nevertheless, you know, you have those. But those are going to be. I you know, I I think they're going to have uh, besides the limitations that they point out. I just don't think we can say it's really measuring brain saturation and therefore, I, I, you know, if you have it, I think you have to consider the values, but I think that you have to consider the values with some level of skepticism and validate it with other things. I think if you have a gross imbalance from a baseline, I think you need to make an adjustment, but, you know, to rely on it um, independently and solely I'm uncomfortable, I'm uncomfortable with. So acid-based management, this is gonna be John's area of expertise. I just wanna point out that when you go to deep hypothermia circulatory arrest, there are things that occur, especially with the PCO2, that result in some either vasodilatation or vasoconstriction of the cerebral circulation. And so uh, you can see here the ABG is corrected for the patient's temperature or the ABG is not temperature corrected. Basically, the two things, the difference between pH stat and alpha stat. But John is going to go into it in much more depth, so I'm going to breeze right over it. Now, here is an example and it's a very good diagram. And if you look here, you can see that they're cannulated via the subclavian artery or axillary artery, and the flow is coming like this. They have a clamp here, so it's going up into the brain, and they are relying on the circle of Willis to reconnect it to the contralateral side and then drain down through what would be then the left carotid. That's what they're, that's what they're attempting to do in this configuration, okay? In this configuration, what you see is the blood is being perfused up the, there it is, up the IJ, up the, the, the SVC and the, the jugular. It's perfusing the brain in a retrograde fashion and then draining back through what would be the right carotid and then joining up with the innominate and then also from the left carotid and coming down and joining up on the island that has been removed here. So they call this the island where you have the arch vessels and they've transected it off of the, off of the native aorta. And so you, when you do retrograde, you actually can see this blood returning. And a lot of times you will see a, a, a not insignificant color differential meaning that oxygen is definitely getting extracted from up there in this brain that is 18 degrees. It's also a question of, should you keep your temperature while you're perfusing retrograde, keep your heater cooler on at 18 degrees? Of course, I believe, yes, of course you should. You should keep that brain as cold as possible. Then the question is, should you keep your volatile anesthetics on? Probably not going to need them for an anesthesia purposes, but because of the positive influence it has on cerebral blood flow and cerebral metabolic rate for oxygen, I would think you would want to. So that's a good question. I couldn't find the definitive, definitive answer to that, but commonsensically, it tells, I, I believe you should. So this is a diagram of what we typically see um, with a more exotic approach where you're perfusing all of the arch, uh, or you're not perfusing the, the innominate, I'm sorry, you're perfusing the, uh, the uh, 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 left carotid, no, yeah, that would be, let me see here, hold on. 
I guess that's the right car- the left carotid and subclavian, John. That's what it looks like to me. But because uh, that's going to get the vertebral, but it doesn't look like they're doing anything with the anomalous there. They're just perfu- yeah, they are. They're perfusing it through. Yeah, I see it now. Okay, so here they're perfusing it right here through the subclavian. It's coming into the anomalous up, and this is going to be going. This is now the right carotid. Then this is the left carotid. And this is the left subclavian. And it's going up the left subclavian because the vertebrals come off of the subclavian and go up to the head. And I'll show you a diagram of that later. So perfusing the, uh, the uh, vertebrals is very important. You can have a pretty big stroke when you're not perfusing those. Hey, John. And I think, yeah. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, about 40% of people do not have a complete circle I'm, of Willis. I'm, tr- I'm getting there. Oh, I'm, okay, I'm, awesome. I'm, I'm getting there, but thank you. <laughs> thank you. I was getting there. Um, and here's another picture, another representation of a more exotic cannulation uh, uh, technique. It's pretty, pretty, pretty dramatic. I would, these are planned cases. Just so you know, these are planned cases. You, this one here and this one here. You don't just do this you know, if you're in the community hospital and you do 200 hearts a year and somebody just rolled in with a type one dissection that can't be transferred and you have to do it, you're not gonna do this. I wouldn't recommend it. There's too many other easy ways to do it that are highly effective. These are for really big planned aortic surgeries by highly trained people and especially the perfusionist. That's a lot of circuitry to really try to keep track of and know what's flowing what with what pressure and what's appropriate. I I wouldn't wanna do it. So here is a, a image of the brain and the circle of Willis, which John just pointed out. And it sort of, you know, wraps around the head, obviously, and it's laid out flat, just to give you an idea of what it is they're depending on. So you can see the blood would come up one of the carotid arteries, then it would go into the anterior communicating artery, over to the other side and around. And you can sort of dr- figure this out in your head, how that all kind of m- goes in a big circle. And one would hope that that would be good enough. Here's another example of it and kind of what it looks like, just to give you an idea. I think it shows two of the vertebrals coming off the subclavians very nicely there, very clearly, essentially perfusing your basal artery. And so you would essentially eliminate basal artery flow in some of those other models. Were it not for the circle of Willis or possibly maybe not, John. So here is the uh, information that John uh, just alluded to. So they took these cadavers and they chopped them up and looked at their brains. And basically kind of getting to the bottom line here, 46% of people had an incomplete. And by incomplete, it means that the arteries communicating across, these communicating arteries were too small, too small in diameter to have significant or appreciable flow. And that was really the issue. So when we say an incomplete circle of Willis, it really is referring to the diameter of the blood vessels that are communicating the two halves together are just simply too diminutive in size to be effective. And with that said, they talk about contralateral uh, uh, perfusion to the brain seems to be good for most patients undergoing operations of the aortic arch. However, addition, or but additional means of brain protection are still needed. This is a very important article that anyone that does antigrade cerebral perfusion needs to look at and consider when they are confronted with this type of a, of a patient and, and situation. This is an article by uh, Dr. Estrera. He was with Dr. Safi. Um, he does a tremendous, of course, Dr. Safi does, uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, a giant in the field of aortic surgery. Um, and Dr. Estrera trained with him uh, or under him and became his protege and really has mastered that craft as well. So he does a lot. And uh, th- this is what they do here at the Texas Medical Center at Memorial Hermann UT. 
Um, they use retrograde cerebral perfusion uh, preferentially, and they have incredibly good outcomes. And I guess my view is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's how I'm gonna say about that. So here's an example of a system. And if you look here, you have the reservoir draining the blood from the patient. And you look up here, coming out, coming down. It goes into the pump, into the membrane oxygenator, comes out. And if it were going to be going back to the femoral artery, it would go this way and like this. But we clamped it here so it would follow this additional circuit, go up here, go into the venous system and the IJ. So this is a method for performing retrograde cerebral perfusion. It's a system, not system I like. I'm gonna show you the system I like. It's a lot, in my view, it's a lot more simple. And then you see the blood represented by this blue, because normally, of course, in the normal circulation, it's red going that way. You see it as blue coming this way. And when they are having these things transected, you can actually watch that blood coming through these vessels, which is very helpful. So this is what I prefer. Um, and uh, this came out of, this was in 2003, uh, and it's a system, I, I don't think I got my system from them because I think I was doing it this way before, but what I do is I take my arterial line and it goes into the femoral artery and I create a bridge between it and my venous. Here's my bicaval venous drainage right here. This is this shows a bicable. I like to use just a regular single so you really have good drainage. But your venous line is normally coming down like this and going to your reservoir to the pump right here. But so if I put a clamp here and I put a clamp here and the surgeon puts a clamp here, then my flow is going to be going like this out of the arterial into the venous like this and right up the superior vena cava to the brain. And that for me is the most simple approach towards doing this. Now with the caveat, I flip this connector. I actually have it facing the other way so that this blood doesn't have to make that right angle. Probably doesn't make any difference because the flows are pretty low, but I do flip it. Uh, but that's just my, my way of doing it. So cerebral perfusion opening pressure. When you do antegrade or retrograde, either one, you have to have enough flow and pressure to get the cerebral vascular system to open up and start being perfused. And I'll, I'm gonna say this now, but I'm gonna say it again later. If you have TCD, it makes doing these operations a whole lot easier because you can actually see the middle cerebral artery and know whether or not you have good flow. Okay, so you need it to, to have an evenly distributed perfusion to the brain. Normal brain blood flow is between 700 and 900 mLs or 50 to 55 mLs per 100 grams of brain matter and the brain weighs about 1300 grams on average or it's 15% of your cardiac output. So you can figure it out from all of that. When we first go on, I like to drive the pressure up to between 60 and 70. And remember that this is transitioning back to native circulatory flow patterns. So you have to remember that. Maintain it at about 40 to 50. Now some say 25, but the cases that I've done, and I've done a couple of hundred of them, and uh, of the last, let's say 50 that I did, I kept the pressure between 40 and 50 with a flow rate of about 400 to 500 milliliters per minute. I was able to easily visualize the blood coming back through the arch vessels, and it was really pronounced, it's real obvious that you have flow. Um, again, I do think TCD would be an extremely valuable tool. I wish we used it more frequently. I wish it was more available to us. I wish it was more common. I wish that there wasn't so many turf wars up at the head of the table. I wish it was just something we accepted to do, kind of like doing, uh, putting an ET tube in somebody that's gonna be under general anesthesia. Um, I do believe luxurious flow is better to a point, 
I think you can be excessively luxurious and end up with a lot of edema. I think you need to be really careful about maintaining your, uh, your osmotic pressure, your oncotic pressure, your electrolytes, your, your PCO2. You really, you know, when you go on cerebral perfusion, you're on circa rest and you're on selective cerebral perfusion, you still need to monitor your blood gases. You still need to look at what's going on with your electrolytes and your metabolites in that blood because that is what is going straight to the brain. Um, monitor gases, acid-base status, cerebral perfusate, maintain normal physiologic balance. And that's very important. You want to keep the COP normal. You do not want the brain to be being perfused with a grossly hypotonic or, or not hypotonic, rather uh, hypo-oncotic fluid that is going to third space into the brain and cause a lot of brain edema. So you've really got to be cognizant and cautious of that. Rewarming. Rewarming after completion of the portion of the surgery that requires deep hypothermia, and they time this so that they're able to do the, they do the distal anastomosis first, and then what they'll do is fill that and clamp it with enough length that they can do the proximal, and then you can go back on native circulation and start very slowly your rewarming process. And then they do the proximal portion of the anastomosis just under normal, normal perfusion. So that's how they time these things out. Um, this is though very important. Um, you need to maintain your temperature where you had it, like 18 degrees, when you return to native circulation for about 10 minutes so that you can reperfuse uh, re the, uh, the CNS. That's the very, very important. If you don't do that, then you're gonna have this great temperature differential that's gonna jump up real fast over here and you're gonna have a problem over there and you're not gonna want that to happen. Maintain your uh, arterial venous temperature gradient at less than 10 degrees centigrade. Warming must be slow and usually limited to a half a degree per every two minutes. Rewarming times of 90 minutes should be expected. You do a type one dissection, you do a brilliant operation, you had a great perfusion run, and you rush warming the patient because everybody wants to get out of the room and the patient has a stroke because you rewarmed them too fast, what the heck have you done? Take, you gotta take your time. Um, don't exceed a temperature, a blood temperature of 36.5 degrees. It will severely exacerbate any neurologic injury that may have occurred from embolization, from uh, whether it be particulate or air, or from just a bad distribution of flow to a certain, just one area of the brain. So you wanna be very careful about how you rewarm the patient and not go over 36.5 degrees. And also plan to aggressively treat hypothermic induced coagulopathy. Now I'll tell you, back in the days of Trasolol, we did these cases, they were chipped dry. I, Trasolol really did work. Um, but, uh, but of course we don't have it anymore. So it's really kind of a, a, a moot point, but I've done them even without a protonin or trosolol and, uh, have not had, uh, and, and have done many cases where if you get them tuned up, right, you know, we might've had to transfuse some, some clotting factors, but really gross, profound hypothermic induced coagulopathy. If you take your time rewarming, if you use a good system, if you use hemoconcentration, if you make sure that your numbers look good, uh, your albumin levels are good, um, if you do need to add a little bit of blood or a little bit of plasma, that's fine. You should be fine. If your anastomosis is good, should do fine. If they're not, tissue's not edematous, they should do fine. You know, because of course the surgeon, I'm sure, there's no way an anastomosis leaks when a surgeon does that operation, right, John? Never, it's never the proline's fault. Not that I've ever seen. Correct, <laughs> right. Something else. They handed them the wrong suture. Something happened. Your, your pressure was too high. There's a reason it happened. Um, so with that said, I think if you really tune these patients up, they do remarkably well after these operations, um, as long as, again, there's integrity of the anastomoses, they have uh, their, their fluid volume distribution is normal. 
Um, you don't have them edematous. You've given them really good brain protection with hypothermia, pharmacologic agents, and you have uh, minimized the inflammatory mediators through uh, hemoconcentration and just good technique, uh, kept their oxygen delivery to their brain, rewarmed them slowly, took your time. You know, it's very rewarding when somebody comes in who's 52 years old, um, who shouldn't die, and they have this horrible type one dissection and they, they, they leave the hospital back home with their families. It is a very rewarding portion of this job because those are big cases. Uh, they're dreaded cases, but they're the cases when they're over and the outcome's great, you love your job. So with that said, phone lines are open, questions or comments, John? Hey Joe. Hey Joe. Yeah. Yeah, can you go back just a couple slides? I got a, I got a few good questions and comments for you there. Okay. Um, you, you were showing maybe two slides or three slides back. You're talking about your flow rates of your retrograde cerebral. Uh, yeah, right there. Yeah. Yeah. So I like this slide. You, you, by the way, that was a, a great, great review for anybody who hasn't done a circa rest case in quite a while. Um, great Thank review. You. I really like a number of things on this slide, a couple I want to comment on, a couple I want to ask you about. When you do your opening perfusion flow, you actually do that initial uh, high flow of 700 to 900. Uh, how long do you do that for? Oh, not long. Uh, maybe, uh, let's say, a minute, minute, maybe 30 seconds to a minute. It doesn't take that long. You just need to get that capital, that, that cerebral vasculature perfusion opening pressure to get it to flow and i learned this a lot from dr garami if you go back and look at dr garami did TCD, yeah. yeah he loves tcd if you go back and look at dr garami's presentations from our program you'll find that he talks about that quite a bit and he he did a lot of work with tcd and retrograde perfusion under dr safi and dr safi actually came here was in the studio and gave a presentation i would welcome people to go watch that because this is a guy that really does this operation he did this operation all the time he's recently retired um sadly but uh but you know it is you know it, 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 he did he retired um but with that said um he talks about the need for getting that per, uh, opening pressure there and then backing off. And so that's where this is coming from. So when you say there uh, drive pressure between 60 and 70, where are you measuring that pressure from? That's the, from the, from the, from the uh, we, put a, we put a lower lock right there at the cannula, the connector of the cannula. Oh. That's a line okay. pressure. So it's. It's sort of your line pressure, but very close to the patient. Yes. Line pressure. Yeah, it's a twenty-two okay. French. It's a twenty-two French catheter. It's going to have. It's yeah. not going to have a whole lot of additional resistance. Yeah. Well, I didn't know if it was uh, monitored way back closer to the pump or where, or if you had some type of, um, you know, catheter in the in the SVC that you were using. I was just curious about no, that. No, that's such a and good. Then, that uh, is such a good question. You know I what? Wanna, a, uh, let me let me just. What's a B B go ahead. Here, wait, John, before you go any further, let me, let, me, let me say that because that was a very good point. What I like to do is take the, that, that line, if there's a lower lock on it, put, the, put the, the, the monitoring line. It goes to anesthesia so I can see it on the monitor. I want it to be a, a zeroed line that I know I can rely on that pressure and I want to be able to watch that line throughout the course of the procedure. So that's the technique that I use. I didn't put that in here, but since you brought it up, I wanted to make that point because it's an important point. And, uh, and another thing, so you know what's surprising, and you touched on this a couple times earlier in the lecture, but I, I, I want you to stay on this slide though for that. And that is, we noticed the same thing back in the day when we first started doing retrograde cardioplegia. It was really surprising how dark the, the surgeons would see that blood coming back up through the coronary arteries. And I suspect your comment with regard to this has to do with that same thing. Even though you haven't been circa arrested very long, you know, you, you circa arrested, it probably wasn't a, but a few minutes or so before you got the retrograde cerebral perfusion up and running. Right. And next thing you know, it's really dark what comes back through those uh, carotids, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, you're yeah. you're 100% correct. 
Um, and we continue to see, even at 18 degree perfused, perfusate temperature, the blood going in at 18, we continue to see a relatively easy uh, uh, color difference um, mm -hmm. throughout the course of the procedure. Now, the first short period of time, it is dramatic, but it does improve. It just looks more kind of more normal. Um, maybe maybe it's a little bit brighter than what you would see, you know, for a na you know for somebody who's just walking around like I am now. But there's a definitive color difference, and there's no doubt in my mind that there is oxygen being extracted by that brain at 18 degrees. And that's got to be reassuring that it's actually occurring at that cold of a temperature. The other thing I would comment is um, the thought, and I've had been asked this before. You know, well, doesn't some of the blood, when you're doing this retrograde uh, cerebral, the way you're doing it up the SVC, doesn't some of this blood go down the arm? And the answer to that is no, because of the valves that are in your uh, arms, For, fortunately, your one-way valves in your veins. Correct. 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 Yeah. That is correct. So you don't need to, uh, now, now that brings me to my other point, which was you did show a little bit on cannulating the axillary artery. I don't know if you've ever done an entire perfusion run by, by cannulating through the axillary artery, and I, and I have, and it was very, very high pressures that we had to run mm -hmm. for, the, for whatever particular reason. Well, um, you know, well, I, I don't know if you know, ever experienced that. Yeah, John, and I think you're 100% right. I, I, I know there's a debate about whether or not the brain is adequately perfused, retrograde, or if it's superior through its normal circulatory route. So, you know, from my point of my, my, my thinking is it isn't normal if only one head vessel or the, the, the right carotid is being perfused. So that's not normal because the left is normally perfused also, right? The anomaly gets perfused, the right carotid and the left carotid and the left subclavian. So we're only gonna perfuse one. So to say it's more natural, more normal, is counterintuitive to me. There's nothing normal about this. It'd be like me going in and just clamping one of your carotids off. I don't think you're gonna be very happy with me if I do that. But then to understand that 46% of the population, more female than male, by the way, um, mm. have an, an incomplete circle of Willis, one that is not very, that is not truly functional. And the people that did that research state unequivocally that if you're going to use single arch vessel cannulation, or axillary cannulation to perfuse the brain and depend on the circle of Willis, you need something else besides that. Mm. I mean, I think, I don't think you can be more clear. So retrograde to me, it reduces the embolic risk, it flushes it out, it's proven by people who are recognized worldwide, and that is Dr. Safi and Dr. Estrera. I mean, they are both recognized around the globe as being truly expert aortic surgeons, that they use retrograde for these very reasons I'm going to listen to somebody like that. I'm not going to listen to somebody who just does, does you know, uh, uh, 200 cabbages a year and one of these a year. I, I, I want to talk to the guy who does this every day. That's how I, that's what I want to follow. Well, if you, I'm making a comment and, and asking you a question at the same time. If you do it the way you're, the way you demonstrated with the retrograde uh, cerebral perfusion up the SVC, you're pretty much guaranteed that your retrograde venous flow is going to get everywhere, regardless of the patient's anatomy, right? Because you're, you, you don't have to worry as much about a missing uh, branch or part of the circle of the circle of wills no. because the venous uh, no. blood supply is gonna go to the capillaries and it's gonna have to find its way back down to the carotids, whereas what? opposed to the other way, other way around, and you're only doing one carotid, you may be missing out on something. Is, Absolutely. Is that correct? Absolutely. And still see blood coming down the contralateral carotid. Doesn't mean mm -hmm. that because you could have one side or the other that's incomplete. 
So you don't really know, and how do you assess that? You're sort of looking at it, it's kind of a guess at that point in time. I would again refer you back to uh, Dr. Garami, Zolt Garami, you can look him up online, great guy, super uh, incredibly uh, knowledgeable on TCD. If we do retrograde and use TCD, you can literally see both middle cerebral arteries flowing. So if you're flowing both middle cerebral arteries, they're flowing the obviously opposite direction of what is normal, but they're flowing backwards, but there's flow in them, you know you're okay. How do you not know you're, how do you, how do you, how do you, how would you, how would you think otherwise? Let me ask you this. Um, you didn't touch on this, I don't believe, but in a, in, I remember, you know, so many years ago when, when we were doing this, um, well, a well, couple things. Number one, I think a lot of people um, think to themselves, um, you know, if I'm doing any retrograde or even integrate cerebral perfusion at all, I'm a lot better off. I'm a lot better off than we were when we were just doing circa rest without it. I think I've heard that kind of approach before, but I think that uh, that that idea is dying off a little bit for the reasons you said. But my my question was, two or three minutes before you go to circa rest, are you making the patient alkalotic? That's a really good question, and the answer to that is no. Um, that's a great question. No, I'm not. I, I just am, I get my acid base at exactly where I want it to be, and that's where I, that's where I go. I don't make them alkalotic. But I think it's relatively, I think a lot of people probably do, right? I mean, I, I was speaking with somebody about this the other day, and they, they, they make them a little bit alkalotic before they you know, two minute warning. We used to have what we called two minute warning. The surgeon would say, okay, take two minutes. I would go ahead and get the patient. At that point, I would go ahead and hyperventilate, give some bicarb. And then, you know, we knew we were going to get acidotic, right? Because we were going to have a, a 45 minute circa rest back, back mm -hmm. in this particular surgeon I worked with. And, you know, so we would do that. But I just wonder nowadays, do, yeah, do people the, still approach it that way? The, well, I mean, not, not, not for me. In the cases that I do, of course, we're looking at usually a 20 to 30 minute uh, oh. circa rest time because they're just gonna do that distal anastomosis as I talked about. I didn't, I never really spent time doing big aortic surgeries, so it's mm -hmm. not my thing. Yeah, I'll be right there, promise. We got a caller, so I wanna make sure we get them, but I wanna answer your question first. Um, so, you know, I, I think that, you know, an amp of bicarb or even a two amps of bicarb and breathing off some CO2, I think that's counterintuitive to blow off the CO2. I don't think that's a smart thing to do at all because I think CO2 is going to constrict cerebral blood flow and when you drop it like that. So I don't think that makes sense. Um, I think making them more alkalotic de shifts the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve and reduces the oxygen release to the tissue, which I don't want to compromise. So for me, I don't, think, I don't think that makes sense, but there could be good reason for it for people who do longer circa rest times. I'm talking 20 to 30 minutes and uh, sometimes even less than that. We spend way more time cooling and way more time warming, but these people leave looking like my snowman with a smile on their face and not out of a pine box. So I'm happy with that. If yeah, that answers your question. Go ahead and take your call. Be yeah. interested to see what the caller says. Yes, sir. You're on the air or ma'am? Yes. Uh, this is not ma'am, but I heard my name on, the, on Facebook. This is hey, Dr. Garami. Dr. Garami just called. So talk to us, Doc. Yeah, what's what's I, right? What? Well, FBI, FBI just reported that my name was heard on Facebook, and I just had to call in, man. Yeah, Congratulations for the great, uh, great program. And I just wanted to add uh, one really crucial detail with the retrograde RCP experience we had. So when TCB was showing the capillary opening pressure, I think you have to go open uh, over like 40 millimeter pressure gradient, which be, what's the difference between our and Venus side. So we started with, instead of 500 cc per minute, a little bit higher. We started uh, 600, mm -hmm. no flow. 700, no flow. 800, I see a flow. No, we can go back to 500. So I think what was crucial is that we could identify a capillary opening pressure. And after that, because we are afraid of the edema as well, that's on the venous side, we sure. interfere too much with the flow. So we able to uh, bring it down to 500, and sometimes uh, it was even less than 500. 
Mm -hmm. was really crucial, I think, uh, what we learned in the beginning, that the stupid TCD has some wall filter, and the flow sometimes was so minimal that it was really filtered out. Yes. And what we were focusing, that we'll try to uh, flow a similar flow velocity, what we saw during the cooling down part. So we could almost match on the retrograde silver perfusion uh, what was we were flowing anterograde fashion. Yeah. And uh, we did uh, very few cases with uh, Dr. Safi and Dr. Estrera with uh, anterograde cannulation. Uh, another finding, I think, from the surgeon was that it was extremely busy because you have a cannula on an open, um, operating field. Why do you do the retrograde uh, super perfusion? The opening is quite open. Those cannulas are not obstructing your views. And I think uh, you mentioned, Joe, the, for me, the most important part is uh, you are preventing embolization. And uh, from the literature, what I saw the first time they used the retrograde circuit perfusion, where and in Japan, incidentally, uh, they pumped uh, the patient with air. And what they wanted to do is de-air the patient this is how the retrograde silver perfusion was used the first time. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought that uh, this is what we can show with the DCD. And I think the DCD had a good value. Also, after you done the operation, the uh, proximal anastomosis, and you completed everything, during the warm-up, as you said, you don't want to do really fast warm-up because that's the hyper area. Yes. So when from the cold you are warming up, I think the TCD value what we are using today is double the velocity. That will show hyperemia flow, so the brain is really stunned, unable to really uh, auto regulate uh, auto regulation uh, to to for for that flow. So the double velocity was our our guidance for the warm up, but also for the integrated flow as well. Very but, interesting. Um, congratulations for your program, and uh, um, I'm, I just would like to say uh, keep educating us because I think it's very helpful uh, and spread news uh, about TCD because I think every operation should be monitored with TCD. I and agree uh, with stay safe, man. You too, sir. And thank you so much for the kindness of your call. And I agree with you, TCD is something that needs to be more uh, in the mainstream and not something that is uh, used only in selective academic centers. It really does need to get out into the community world because it does bring a tremendous amount of value. I agree with you 100%. Would like to get you back on the program maybe one day. Sure, sure, sure. I just need to uh, finish my quarantine with my COVID shit and I'll be happy to uh, back on the podium. Okay, Otherwise, we can do remotely. Well, I'm going to redo, <laughs> the, I'm going to have the New Orleans conference again, so I expect to see you there. I will see you in New Orleans for sure. All right, bye-bye, sir. Thank you. Bye. See Bye. you guys. So, John, I think he answered the questions uh, that, you, uh, that you had, I hope. And uh, I was wondering if, with your permission, if we could take maybe a short two-minute break. Maybe, or how much time do we need? Six minutes. So we're going to take, could we take a six minute break and then come back and do your, your slide deck? That'd be perfect. That'd perfect. be great. That'd be great. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. We'll be back in six minutes. Okay. So don't go too far. Thank you all. Six minutes. The Point of Care program at Huntsville Hospital is approaching its 20 year anniversary as we began to grow as a hospital and provide more complex services to our community, the need for point of care testing became very clear in our organization. Many of our departments consider the EPOT device to be crucial to their ability to quickly move their patients from entry to the hospital to procedural room. It helps them monitor the patient's status during their procedures and post procedure so it's very integrated into our entire continuum of patient care. If you have any patient population where blood management is crucial, then a point of care device is very useful in those types of settings. It can provide a quick result on a very small amount of blood and, and that is really important in some of our patient population. We are starting a new process where we're going to screen our patients on the floor for sepsis. The patient can look and, and actually feel okay they will show us signs and symptoms of sepsis. So what we do when they show these signs, we get a lactate level. Lactic acid is a, a product of the sepsis cascade. So with sepsis, the inflammatory light switch goes on, 
the cascade starts churning, and unfortunately, once it starts going, we have to stop it. It will not stop on its own. The faster the lab draw, the faster the lab results, the faster you can, you can act on it. The process in the lab is what the process is. It just takes a certain amount of time for the instruments to run those tests. I mean, we're talking 30 minutes even on a stat because that's the process. You, that's just how long it takes. There's not really anything you can do about that. For every hour you wait to give an antibiotic, the mortality for that patient increases 8%. So now that we have the handheld device, the nurse can get those results within a few minutes and we know how to treat that patient. If a patient is going into septic shock, we do not have minutes to spare. We have got to get it done quickly. So when you get the little beep from the epoch that says your results are in, you're, you go with it. You don't even think twice about it. You're like, this is, this is good. This is what I'm gonna do for this patient. The next steps are clear. I think our mortality on the, the initial floors dropped by almost 50% in the first three to six months. At this point, we're about hospital-wide. We, I think we'll be hospital-wide another two to four months. So this has become a huge program uh, within our, our system. Without the EPOC device, it would really be hard for us to get everything done in the timely manner. So it's really helped us to get our program going. I mean, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a medicine doctor, whether you're a dermatologist, you want to be able to do things in a timely fashion so that you can be most effective. This really makes a difference in patient outcomes. Mix cannulae, expanding performance standards. High performance cannulae for direct and femoral cannulation in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Levanova's complete range of mix dedicated products allow easy and reproducible procedures. The portfolio includes the sutureless aortic valve Percival, Memo 4D for mitral valve repair, the HeartLink system for assisting the perfusionist in applying goal-directed perfusion therapy and a broad choice of high-performance dedicated cannulae. Leva Nova's range of cannulae suit every cannulation technique for minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Venous and arterial femoral cannulation can be performed using the Wrap Venous Cannula and the Easy Flow Duo. For arterial direct and venous femoral cannulation, the EasyFlow aortic cannula and the wrap are available. For venous femoral access, the Levanova wrap cannula features a dual stage configuration for optimal drainage of the inferior and superior vena cava without interfering with the right atrium. The high flow dynamics of wrap improves the capability of drainage with a low pressure drop. An optional Selinger dilator kit is available to perform percutaneous insertion. The Levanova EasyFlow Duo cannula is designed for a safe and smooth femoral arterial cannulation. Its conical dispersion tip design allows a more gentle flow in the femoral artery, and its red cap avoids blood backflow during obturator removal. A dilator kit for percutaneous insertion is also included with the cannula. Easy flow cannulae are designed for safe, reproducible direct aortic cannulation and include a malleable stylet to aid cannulation insertion, facilitating bloodless introduction into the aortic arch, as well as a special conical dispersion tip for a more gentle flow in the vessel to reduce shear stress. Like all perfusion professionals today, we are busy and frequently short-staffed. Does taking time off for a conference create a burden for your teammates? Has reimbursement for your continuing education dropped? Have you priced the cost of going to a meeting lately? Registration fees, airfare, transportation and parking, hotel, and meals out? This totals up to having an out-of-pocket expense of over $2,500. 
and then you hope the content is good. Perfusion Education has heard your concerns. They have a simple and seamless system that works on any platform, computer, tablet, or even your phone. You can chat during the program or even phone in and be live on the air. The content, second to none. Perfusion Education is by Perfusionist and for Perfusionist. Create a free account and check us out today. And welcome back, everyone. John, thank you very much. I needed that little break. I got some. I got. I got myself some more tea, so uh, some more iced tea. So, John, without further ado, we'll go forward with alpha stat and pH stat because I do find that those. That's a very tough topic. Well, your, your lecture was a perfect lead-in. I was really impressed with the, 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 uh, the, 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 the foundation that you kind of laid with this, with your lecture. I wasn't expecting it to be so, uh, so, so, so perfect. So hopefully um, we can learn a few things. Um, it's not my most strong suit as well. I'm not a pediatric perfusionist. This applies a little bit more towards p the pediatric guys and gals. So I'd, I'd love to have a pediatric uh, perfusionist call in and maybe set us straight on a couple of these things, but we're going to do the best we can. I don't have any disclosures, and um, I made the slides a little bit easier today, Joe. A lot of them are going to have everything they need on them. So what are the main issues when you look at, you know, the difference of managing your patient with alpha stat or pH stat? <clears throat> well, we have stroke, cerebral, and cardiac dysfunction are common after, like you were saying, Joe, after complex cardiac surgery using hypothermic bypass and cardiac surgery using deep hypothermic circuitry arrest, um, hypothermic bypass induces changes of the pH and of the PCO2, something I think you alluded to. Uh, the pH affects intracellular function and regeneration of cells after ischemia. PCO2 affects cerebral blood flow, as you know as well as the speed and homogeneity of the cooling when you're doing these circuit arrest cases. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the neurological dysfunction after cardiac surgery, right? You have, you have global ischemia, right? You have circulatory arrest, but you also have focal ischemia, like as in a stroke. Embolization of the atherosclerotic material from the aorta or the arch vessels can break off and go up upstream. You have risk factors like age, diabetes, hypertension, and then um, reduced cerebral blood flow reduces the risk of embolization, but increases the risk of hypoperfusion. So we're beginning to see the, 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 the pluses and minuses are going to come clear more and more of pH stat versus alpha stat. So when we look at brain physiology, the brain is 2% of the total body weight, but needs and requires 15% of our resting cardiac output. It consumes 20% of our total body oxygen consumption, and the cerebral metabolic rate is related to the oxygen consumption. Those two have to be uh, in line with each other, and it averages about 50 milliliters per minute in adults, and the greatest uh, needs are in the gray matter. So when we look at neurological dysfunction with circuitry arrest, normothermia, brain injury occurs at about four to four and a half minutes of, at normal, normal, normal temperature. Hypothermia, 18 to 20 degrees like you mentioned, Joe, obviously allows for much longer periods of that uh, lack, lack of perfusion. Most patients tolerate deep hypothermic circuitry arrest up to about 30 or 40 minutes without neurologic dysfunction. Greater than 60 minutes, the majority of patients will definitely suffer irreversible brain injury. But like you said, Joe, you really like to keep it closer to that 30 to 35. So if we look at our, our cerebral metabolic rate and how it drops in proportion with hypothermia, here's a slide, and I put here in red, 37 degrees along the bottom, and the cerebral oxygen consumption along uh, the y-axis, is about one milliliter per 100 grams per minute of cerebral, of cerebral uh, brain mass at 30. And you look at the blue line that I put there, way down at 18 degrees, this goes down to almost 0.1. So this is 
if you want to have some idea how we came up with the 40 or 45 minutes of safe circuit to arrest time, this gives you a good rule of thumb. If at, if it's four minutes of safe circuit to arrest time at 37, it's one-tenth. What happened to John? Oh, John, you're... Uh-oh. Did we lose him? Awesome. Oh. Did it? I'm still here. Yeah, there you are. You're back. You still hear me? Yeah, we lost yeah. your voice. So, I would say, so, so, can you hear me? Okay, yeah. so the, um, when you go down to, uh, say, 17 or 18 degrees, this goes down to one-tenth the cerebral oxygen consumption at 37 degrees. So if you're safe at four minutes at 37, you're relatively reasonable that you're going to be safe for 40 minutes down at about 17 or 18 degrees. So cerebral autoregulation. So CBF, it's tightly coupled to cerebric metabolic demands. It's constant over a wide range of perfusion pressures, but cerebral autoregulation uh, is maintained in moderate hypothermia, somewhere about 28 degrees and above, it's maintained its autoregulation pretty well. But when you get down below 22 degrees, which is usually your profound circulatory rest and below, your autoregulation becomes impaired. So what I was just saying about blood pressure, so here's a slide that shows cerebral blood flow on the left and blood pressure along the bottom. And it's kind of giving you an idea of the ability of your cerebral autoregulation. And basically, it's, it maintains its autoregulation generally accepted at a pressure of 50 and above. And it gets um, uh, out of whack in a different way when you get above 150 because now you're having such a high pressure force mediated dilatation of the blood vessels and you can have overflow due to that and um, below that below 50 though it's basically accepted that you might have an impairment of the cerebral autoregulation and arterial collapse and possibly ischemia so joe i think you would love this slide you just talked the other day when we were talking about blood transfusions, about Dr. Drew, and I couldn't believe Charles Drew back in 1959 in, in London. Dr. Drew, it was a cardiac surgeon and is credited with the first successful repair of an ASD and VSD septal defect in between 1970 and 1973. And he operated on infants that were only a few weeks old using profound hypothermia with circuitry arrest and some limited cardiopulmonary bypass. His arrest times were between 38 and 67 minutes. And get this, Joe, 23 out of 24 of his tetralogy cases all survived. That's impressive. Mm -hmm. That's impressive. So we, we love to talk about the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. So I want you guys to try to keep as much of this in mind as you can as we begin to go through this, because a lot of this comes into play. So there's your oxy, oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. If you look um, up at the top where it says left, what shifts the curve to the left, which is an increased affinity for hemoglobin, meaning the hemoglobin is going to hold on to the oxygen more tightly and not tend to let it go as easily in the tissues, that's going to shift when it shifts to the left. A decreased temperature, a decreased 2,3 P DPG, decreased a high which is uh, increased pH, uh, that will, alkalosis, all are going to increase infinity. To the right is the opposite, a, redu a reduction in, in affinity, increased temperature, increased levels of 2,3-DPG, increased uh, hydrogen ion, which is acidosis. So here's a, a, a mnemonic for people that you can use. It says cadet turn right, C-A-D-E-T, carbon dioxide, acid, 2,3-DPG, exercise, temperature, all move the, t the curve to the right. So that's one way you can kind of try to remember some of this. So acid-based management during hypothermia. In, in, in John, you're, ki John, wait, John. Yeah, your, your connection's not good. We keep losing you. Want me to disconnect and reconnect on my end or something? Yeah, yeah. Why don't you do that? Because we're losing your, we're losing you in the middle of it. So let's just take. We'll we'll stay right here. I'll stay with the audience. Okay. 
I'll talk to them while you're doing that and uh, talk about your slide um, with the uh, alligator. I saw the alligator. I don't remember what the other one was. Do you, is anybody else? But uh, let's see, what was there? I saw the alligator and it looks like some kind of marsupial that's hibernating. I'm not sure what it is. Can you, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, that's better. Yeah, it's, you sound better too. You had a strange delay as well on my end. So maybe we got a better connection. You want me to back up a slide or two? Or? Um, no, I would start with that right there. Acid-based management during hypothermia in vivo with your alligator and marsupial. See? You sound better on my end as well, so hopefully we got a little improvement there. So, um, yeah, well, if you're talking about acid-based acid management with these um, animals that we can try to associate, or how we should strategize, you have different strategies for different animals. Some must remain active while hypothermic. That's your reptiles there, your alligator, while others go hypothermic during hibernation. Hmm. Go ahead. Next slide. Mm -hmm. So, the cold-blooded animals, thermal regulation with cold-blooded animals, these are ectotherms. Their body temperature closely follows their ambient temperature, right? Op optimal enzyme efficiency occurs with hypothermia with them. Intracellular and extracellular pH are allowed to increase in hypothermia. This is the alpha stat approach, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more uh, elaborately so you can understand it a little more clearly. But then we have, go ahead, Joe, we have the thermal regulation of cold-blooded animals, the ectotherms. Their intracellular pH is very close to the neutral pH of water. Arterial blood pH remains more alkaline than their intracellular pH. There's a constant hydrogen ion gradient across the cell membranes over all temperatures. And this helps eliminate intracellular acids and carbon dioxide. I know that sounds confusing, it's gonna get a little more clear. So these animals, the warm-blooded animals, they're in a state of inactivity and metabolic depression. They lower, their, they lower their body temperature, slow their breathing, slow their heart rate, and lower their metabolic rate. So they maintain their arterial pH near 7.0, 7.4, I'm sorry, 7.40 during hypothermia. Intracellular acidosis leads to a depressed metabolism. This preserves intracellular substrates, and this is what's known as the pH stat approach. So let's look at cerebral autoregulation with regard to carbon dioxide in particular. So carbon dioxide is a potent, direct cerebral vasodilator. It alters your cerebral regulation. Hypercapnia, high CO2 levels, cause dilatation of the cerebral arteries and increase cerebral blood flow. Hypocapnia, of course, causes constriction and a decrease of cerebral blood flow. Now the, now the PCO2 changes during hypothermia. Okay, I see a, a little graph there. Decreasing blood temperature increases the solubility of carbon dioxide in the blood. As more carbon dioxide dissolves in the blood, this decreases the partial pressure of carbon of the of the CO2. So if you look at the graph there, solubility of water, this happens to be with water, but it applies to, to blood and to most, most fluids on the on the y-axis and temperature along the bottom. And it happens to show oxygen there in red and carbon dioxide. Now remember, carbon dioxide is 21 times more soluble than oxygen. So you see it's not very much of a change with oxygen. There's one reason why we don't talk about it all that much. It does occur, but it's slight. But carbon dioxide has a tremendous change over temperature. And that's why we talk, talk about it so much. So PCO2 changes during hypothermia. Blood drawn during hypothermia and then warmed to 37 degrees. This is what happens when you draw of sample from your patients who's hypothermic, and then you take that sample and put it in your blood gas machine. It, they all warm them up to 37 degrees. Joe, do you know of any machine that you can tell to run it at the temperature of the patient? I do believe you can do that. I, you know, I'm, I'm not 100% positive, but I'm, 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 I'll say I'm 90% that you can do that with the Siemens Rapid Point. You can temperature correct or not temperature correct. Interesting. Okay. So when you do that, the carbon dioxide that was initially dissolved because you were so cold will now expand 
causing an increased PCO2 reading on your blood gas. If, if it's corrected to the patient's actual temperature, then the result is going to be a reduced PCO2 despite the same CO2 content. So what I'm saying here is that the total carbon dioxide content is going to remain the same because it's shifting from dissolved to undissolved with the PCO2. Now, I will say that when I do my blood gases, um, when I've sent them out to the lab, and I'm not positive, I really have to think about this, but I will tell them I do not temperature correct. So mm -hmm. I am assuming, you know, and maybe wrongly, that they are running it at the actual temperature. I, and, and you know what, John, I don't know the answer to that 100%, but it's a good question. You get a, do you get a printout back or do you have to look up your blood gas on the computer? Uh, those were the days, well, they would just either send it, call it in, they would call usually, but uh, you can yeah. go look it up in the chart later. But generally speaking, no, we didn't have a computer in the room. Yeah. Well, if you're talking the old days, they had no, the, the only way to do it was with 37. I think 99% now still is, but if you ever get a printout, it should always say on there. The corrected versus uncorrected. And I think, that, right? I think that the rapid point does that. And then maybe the gem and maybe the yeah. uh, radiometer do also, but I think you have that as an option. I'm just not a hundred percent positive. Yeah, me either. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Joe. I think I got our next stuff. Uh, Sorry. So here we're going to get, if you want a take-home slide, you want to take a, a screenshot of something. This is a good one for someone to take a screenshot of. You have pH management. You have two choices here, right? You have your pH stat on the left side. You have your alpha stat on the right side. So let's just look at the right side for a second. Alpha stat, that's what most of us adult perfusionists are, are using, right? So if let's say they're, look at the patient's feet, let's say the patient's at 28 degrees, right? So on the right side with alpha stat, you take your blood sample, you take it out of your patient, you send it to the lab, and the lab sends you back a wonderful number. You're, you're just doing a great job as a perfusionist because it says you have a pH of 740 and a PCO2 of 40. But if you look down below, the actual pH inside the patient at that temperature, the reality of what's going on in the body is a pH of 7.56 and a PCO2 of 26. So this is where the pH stat guys come in. What they want to do is they want that 7.40 and PACO2 to be what the patient is. They don't want what the laboratory is saying it is at 37. The patient's not at 37. So when you look at the pH side, the guys there, they draw a sample from the patient and they get this terrible number back, 726 PCO2 of 56, but as a temperature corrected value, they're at 740 and it's PCO2 of 40. So this is the two sets that you have. And we're gonna talk about why would you do one over the other? And the debate has never quite been totally solved. Been raging now for, been raging now for 50, 60 years, right, Joe? At least. So. The other thing that changes when you drop temperature besides the carbon dioxide is the pH. And the pH doesn't just drop because the carbon dioxide changes. It also drops according to the hydrogen ion. And we're not going to get too deep in the weeds on this because this is a topic that you can get very deep in the weeds on if you choose to. So if you see the graph there that I made, pH is on the y-axis temperature along the, the, the x-axis along the bottom and at a temperature where I put the arrow in the line there, 37 degrees, in our blood you have a pH of 7.40, but as you cool down, as you go up the red line to the left, the temperature gets colder, 30, 20, 10, you see how the pH changes. That's We're going to talk about why that is. The pH gets more alkalotic because there's a shift in the way our buffers behave, our protein buffers behave, okay? So keep those two things in mind. So what what's going on here? This is an ionization of the A imidazole groups of proteins on histidines. That's a, that's a mouthful, and it says um, that, you know, we have a lot of protein buffers in our plasma, enormous amount. Okay, these are being regulated, and these are one of the major contributors of this hydrogen iron buffering. These are changing their activity as temperature changes as well. So here's the two schools of thought, alpha stat versus pH stat. The alpha stat strategy does not correct for pH or CO2 changes. 
pH strategy, as I showed in that diagram, does correct for the pH and CO2 changes. And this has been a source of longstanding debate. So let's explore this a little bit further. So let's look at AlphaSat. Now, believe it or not, Joe, I don't know if you remember this, but everybody was doing AlphaSat way back in the 60s and 70s. And somewhere about 75 to 85, there was a huge paradigm shift in adult, uh, adult perfusion where we switched over and changed to AlphaSat. We were doing pH stats. So, and um, it's just an interesting tidbit there, but it's the most widely used approach for acid-base management in adults. It maintains a normal pH of 7.4, pCO2 of 40, measured at 37 degrees. It's uncorrected for arterial blood temperature. It allows the pH to rise and the pCO2 to fall, as I was just showing you in those graphics, naturally with cooling. You end up with a relative respiratory alkalosis at the patient's body temperature and you do not add carbon dioxide to the circuit, which is what would happen in a pH stat scenario. We're gonna look at that. So again, alpha stat. Alpha, the way they came up with this, it's it, it, what it is, it's the ratio of that protonated imidazole that I just mentioned, the imidazole that are, that are attached to, to the hydrogen on, uh, versus the total imidaz imidazole, the histidine residues. You, that's a mouthful. You can research what that means and, uh, and find out more if you care about that. But it has to do with how much buffering is going on that we have the capability of doing. At 37 degrees, this would equal about 0.55, and that gives you an optimal intracellular enzyme structure and function. And normal intracellular pH would be 6.8. Now, you're thinking to yourself, w w normal pH is 6.8. In intracellular, we have a wide variety of different cells in our body, so I put a little fine print there just to clarify this. Physiologically, normal intracellular pH is most common between 7.0 and 7.4, though there is a variability between our tissues. For example, skeletal muscle tends to have a pH of 6.8 to 7.1. There's also a pH variation across different organ organelles and cells, which can span from 4.5 to 8.0. So that just clarifies why you can have that um, type of pH levels intracellularly. Go ahead, Jeff. Sorry. So alpha stat, what are the pros? What are some of the reasons why people will endorse this approach? Well, it preserves your cerebral autoregulation during moderate hypothermia. It avoids luxurious perfusion. perfusion um, it, it reduces an overflow of cerebral, uh, cerebral blood flow, which, you know, most people would argue would decrease the risk of microemboli. I'd like to actually have a controversial discussion with you about that statement, Joe, because that keeps coming back up, but let's continue on. Preferable on a cellular level, enzymatic function is well maintained. It's preferable in adults, and it results in better neurocognitive outcome compared to pH that studies have shown in, in adults for the most part. Go ahead. So what are some of the cons of alphastat? It may result in inadequate, non-homogeneous brain cooling, something you talked about, Joe, before circulatory arrest. You can also have what's called a steel phenomenon, and this is really in congenital heart surgery, where because of the vasoconstriction and vasodilatation in the pulmonary circulation, vasoconstriction in the cerebral, vasodilatation in the pulmonary circulation, a pediatric perfusionist can be concerned that you would actually have an overflow going into the pulmonary circulation and a, and a lack of adequate flow going to the cerebral in this particular strategy. It may result in cerebral dysfunction in children after cardiac surgery. So like I said, this is really becoming a focus on pediatric perfusion. pH stat, let's look at that. Well. As, uh, the, the pH is maintained 7.40 at all temperatures, meaning temperature corrected. It's a traditional acid-based management, uh, management, as I mentioned, is where perfusion started in the 60s and 70s before it changed. Blood gas analysis is performed at 37 degrees, but then you have to have some, used to have be a nomogram years ago. Remember that, Joe? You'd have to look at a nomogram and look at your temperature and find out what your real 
so, uh, pH was and your real CO2 was, the blood gas would send it back to you at 37. But if you were at 28, you had to look at your sliding scale and see what your real results were. Uh, you added CO2 to the sweep gas, right? Uh, your total CO, CO2 stores are elevated. Your, your CO2 uh, levels are elevated. And it gives you a marked respiratory acidosis at 37 degrees when you warm the blood back up because of that high CO2. Mm -hmm. Well, we used, to use, we used to use 95.5 uh, uh, out of a tank for our uh, cases in the, uh, in the, in the you know, mid-70s. When I started, uh, you right. know, the mid to later 70s, 1977, but all the way up until, I mean, the early 80s. And we used 95.5 for that reason. We needed the and, CO2. And we used them for bubble oxygenators because they were too efficient on sweep and too inefficient on oxygenation. Yeah. So we had to put CO2 for then the bubble oxygenators for that reason. So here's an example of what might happen. Look at the second line first where it says 37 degrees, but your patient's at 17. If you were to draw a blood sample at your patient at 17 degrees, you send it off to the lab and they're gonna send you back 7.06 with a PCO2 of 156. But when you, when you temperature correct it, you really have what you were aiming for if you're a pH stat perfusionist, 7.40 and a CO2 of 58. And this is what it means by a severe respiratory acidosis at 37 degrees. It increases cerebral blood flow, but it, it but you lose your cerebral autoregulation. And that is actually usually a good thing when it comes to PEDS, and we're gonna see that why that is. So here are some of the pH stat pros. It's believed to be beneficial for cerebral vasodilatation, as I just said. It increases your cerebral blood flow, and it's quick and homogeneous brain cooling during the cooling phase of deep hypothermic circulatory rest. Just what you said, Joe, in your talk. But it also maintains your cerebral blood flow. If you keep pH stat going throughout your case, not only are you going to have uh, an initial effect, it's going to maintain your cerebral blood flow. Your oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve is shifted to the right. Some more pros on this. It offers protection in neonatal and infant cardiac surgery. It might inhibit cellular metabolism, meaning slowing the metabolism of the brain is going to be uh, protective, less, less metabolic rate. Uh, it's possibly better for neurobehavior development after circulatory arrest in children, studies have shown. Uh, it's particularly beneficial in cyanotic neonates and infants who are basically used to a higher hemoglobin, right, and a higher oxygen transfer. It shifts more cerebral uh, cardio bypass flow towards the cerebral circulation, and as I said, it improves cooling and it improves oxygen supply. So what are some of the cons of doing pH stat? It's slightly greater com complex, it's, it's a slightly more complex compared to alpha stat strategy, probably not for the people who do it every day, but for those of us who are not familiar, you lose your cerebral autoregulation. This a large uh, in, increase in carbon dioxide is such a powerful vasodilator that it overwhelms your cerebral autoregulatory system and it's gonna keep those vessels dilated. So your cerebral blood flow becomes pressure passive you, you flow more, you have higher pressure, you're gonna charge a lot of flow right down those uh, cerebral blood vessels. You have luxury brain perfusion and a complete mismatch of cerebral blood flow and cerebral oxygen metabolic uh, uh, demand, meaning way more flow than you actually need. So some people would say that a con of this is an increased risk of cerebral embolization, and certainly, as you talked in your sh uh, slides show also, Joe, increased possibility of cerebral edema. There's something called a crossover strategy that people, some people use, if you're very sophisticated, I suppose, but I have heard of this, in adults, there's people that use a crossover strategy, trying to straddle the best of both of these. In the first 10 minutes of cooling, they'll do a pH stat, followed by continued cooling with alpha stat, then when they rewarm, they'll use alpha stat. You could dissect out that why that is, but if you look at what they're trying to do, they're trying to improve their cerebral perfusion without overdoing it, and then in the rewarming phase, going back to a more regulated cerebral autoregulation. 
So blood gas management during hypothermic bypass, why is this more important in children, what we're talking about today? Because we use greater degrees of hypothermia, right? Almost far more than in adults. It results in more profound differences in blood carbon dioxide levels. So let's look at pediatric versus adult cardiac surgery. There's differences in the brain neuroplasticity. Adult brains have an increased neuroplasticity. What is neuroplasticity? It's the ability of your brain to recover from, a, from an insult. Children don't have that nearly as well as our developed adult brains do. So they're very susceptible to a slight insult, not being able to recover from it as well. Uh, the presence of atherodomous aorta and cere cere cerebral embolic load and the presence of multiple comorbidities in your adults. So here is a paper, and there's many papers, you guys can look this up all day long, but here's one that I've kept coming across. It was done back in uh, cardiovascular thoracic surgery 2010 by Dr. Aziz and his associates, and it asked the question, is pH stat or alpha stat the best technique to follow in patients undergoing deep hypothermic circuitry arrest. Now, this is a, was a review article. They went out and tried to find all the best studies that have been done on adults comparing alpha stat and pH stat, as well as infants and pediatrics. So um, they reviewed and found, they had a very strict criteria for the studies that they were going to look at. And they have only found 14 that met exactly what they were looking for, because they were trying to look for studies that were going to analyze cerebral metabolism and neuropsychological outcomes. Now, they found 10 adult studies. Seven of those found that alpha stat was better than pH stat, but three found there was no difference if adult perfusionists used pH stat or alpha stat. They found four pediatric studies. Three of them said found that pH stat was better, but one found no difference. Go ahead. So here's a, a couple conclusion slides if you wanna try to bring this all back full circle. So this is a quote from that very same paper. This is in their conclusion statement. In conclusion, there's evidence to suggest that the best technique to follow in the management of acid base in patients undergoing deep hypothermic surgery arrest during surgery, cardiac surgery, is dependent on the age of the patient with better results using pH stat in the pediatric patient and alpha stat in the adult patient, which is why 99% of us are probably following, if we're an adult or pediatric perfusionist, following what we've outlined here today. Now here's some other take home bullet points. Both alpha and pH stat management seems to work well. The physiologic differences appear to be actually fairly subtle. In most cases, alpha stat may be preferable for adults protection from microemboli. That's the topic I want to talk to you about, Joe. pH stat seems to be preferable for children because of its enhanced brain protection. And then that crossover strategy that I talked about where you can combine the two and, and circuitry arrest in adults is something that people uh, who are doing this either have doing, are doing, or could look into. There may be one more slide. And here's some summary statement as well about alpha stat, and there's a summary statement about pH stat. So alpha stat management, which, which is, prevails in reptiles, it aims at, maintain, at maintaining the normal acidemia in the blood and blood gases in the rewarmed blood. In vivo, the hypothermic blood is alkalemic and hypocapnic. Alpha stat management preserves autoregulation of the brain perfusion and optimizes cellular enzyme activity. And hypothermia and alkalemia the oxygen dissociation curve is shifted to the right, resulting in increased affinity for oxygen for hemoglobin, meaning it's not gonna release oxygen into the tissues as easily. Therefore, deep temperature reduction, oxygen diluted in the blood at deep, te at deep, te deep temperature reduction, excuse me. The oxygen that's diluted in the blood represents the main source of oxygen to the tissues. So Joe, when you were talking about perfusing your brain, your patient's brain, retrograde cerebral perfusion at 17, 18 degrees and seeing dark blood coming back, the oxygen hemoglobin uh, curve is so tight to the right, it's probably not releasing a whole lot of oxygen, but the dissolved oxygen in the plasma is probably coming to the rescue in that case and being the main source of oxygen to the tissues. Well, 
Th well, um, I, um, I would have to disagree with you there, and I'll tell you why. Um, and I'm not necessarily disagreeing with you. I just don't think that that is necessarily the reason because the PO2 doesn't affect the color differential. It's the saturation, it's the oxygen hemoglobin combination that causes the color difference. So oxygenated blood, saturated hemoglobin is why arterial blood looks red, not the dissolved oxygen in the plasma. So it well, has to be being good, released. That's, that is a very good point. So what, what this statement here says that I drew from the article there, it says it represents the main source. So maybe it's 60-40 or you know, maybe it's not, uh, you know, maybe there's still a, a, a significant amount of hemoglobin that's able to release oxygen. And then the, uh, the fact that the temperature is so cold that the, that the dissolved oxygen is also contributing, which normally it probably doesn't hardly do at all, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's only a 3% a of oxygen dissolved in the plasma. But that'd be an interesting mm -hmm. research that somebody could, could bring to the forefront. I'd I be think interested if, to see that. I think if I ever do another case like that, I'm gonna request if it's somebody that I, that, I, that I work with a lot that would be willing and friendly enough to do this, would be to get a sample of that uh, blood as it's coming, uh, coming back through the arch vessels. Just take a syringe, suck it up, hand it off, and run a gas on it. I think it would be a fascinating number. I, I, I think those results would be, would be would, they would fascinate me. Mm -hmm. So, because we know what's going in, I'd really like yeah. to know what's coming out. It's coming out of the arterial system, and there's no other way for it to get there except from where I'm sending it. So it's, uh, it would be a very specific, precise, there would be very high precision associated with that, uh, with that examination. Well, well, so what's interesting is we hear so much about this oxygen dissociation curve, our whole perfusion lives, and it's, you know, we shift it to the right, oh, the hemoglobin's not going to be able to release the oxygen. But, you know, at what point does it actually become terribly relevant? Because, you know, you're seeing this, and we see it in the cardioplegia as well. Like I just said before, that the blood comes around these very, very cold organs and tissues, mm -hmm. comes around dark. Mm -hmm. So apparently the hemoglobin is still letting go of that oxygen. Absolutely. Um, and that could be just because we are perhaps not nearly as alkalotic as you think we are. Um, right. Because, so if, you know, if the that, tissue is if the tissue is acidotic, which it is, that's going to pull that curve back over. So, you know, they're probably ended up being re somewhat balanced and that may be exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Here, Here's a general statement similar to the last one in regards to pH stat strategy. It's temperature corrected. pH strategy is the mechanism employed by hibernating animals. So here, here, here I want to stop for a second. Humans, I mean, you know, we are not reptiles and we do not hibernate. So which is the strategy that would be best for us? And this is why this debate has been raging for so many years. We don't have it in our DNA or in, in our development as humans that we've ever had to experience, you know, and become adaptive to any type of hibernation, right? So we don't necessarily know what human beings, what is the right answer for, for well, our particular uh, species? Well, right? I, would rather, I would rather mimic another mammal than a reptile. Yeah. Now there's yeah. some people out there that I think probably do mimic reptiles, but we won't get into that conversation. Okay. So the pH management aims at maintaining normal blood gas values at hypothermic temperatures. The pH strategy results in powerful and sustained cerebral vasodilatation due to the high levels of carbon dioxide. Cerebral autoregulation is lost and cerebral blood flow is greatly increased and resulting in quick and even cooling. When the rewarmed blood becomes acidotic and hypercapnic, meaning when you sample it from the patient and you rewarm it in the blood gas machine, you're going to see that. Hypercapnia shifts the oxyhemoglobin to the left and results in an increased availability of the oxygen to the tissue. So here again, we're talking about people who would probably argue in favor and say, well, what you guys were just saying, when you do pH stat, you don't have to worry about the hemoglobin holding onto the oxygen because 
we have uh, doing a different strategy here. Mm -hmm. And I think that's all I have. Very so, good. That was excellent. Very good, John. I mean, that was a really comprehensive, that was a lot more comprehensive on pH and alpha stat, pH stat and alpha stat um, uh, than I was expecting. It was very, very good, very complete. I have a much better understanding of it, uh, though I don't necessarily think I know which is best um, mm -hmm. at this point. So I'm going to have to think about this for a little while longer. But it was excellent. So um, th there was two slides there where I said I wanted to, uh, kick some things around with you. Um, and, and what it says, and this also has to do, by the way, with um, you were talking about the NEARS or running the Cosmet or, or Foresight during your normal bypass patients, or maybe even on ECMO or whatever. People who run cerebral uh, in, in, infrared spectroscopy like the Cosmet or Foresight, mm -hmm. um, if you do that on all your cases, and in normal routine cases, I think you will learn and see that you'll start running higher CO2 levels mm -hmm. on your mm -hmm. on your gases because you're you're just gonna it's gonna make you do it because mm -hmm. you're gonna see patients that um, the numbers over there anesthesia is getting nervous surgeon looks over the drape they're getting nervous wondering what you're doing you've already increased your flow and done some other things you run a higher CO2 and you're gonna see better numbers so so you you learn to run a higher CO2 in this case here when we're talking about pH stat and alpha stat. The pH stat guys and gals, they're putting a lot more CO2 into their patient's blood and so much so that they have wide cerebral vasodilatation to the point where the, the body's own autoregulation is overwhelmed and it just goes according to how much CO2 is there and stays vasodilated. And the criticism is, well, and this is what my point was, was, well, you know, you have to watch out because you, you're going to possibly have a higher risk of pumping more microemboli because you have a higher flow going to the brain. So my question to you if is... You're what if might, you're anagrade, I guess you could with, 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 well, with, with gases microemboli, more flow, and maybe knocking off stuff off of the, the, the lumen of the you know, vessels you're cannulated or whatever. I guess it's, that's theoretically possible. Um, well, you don't have it if you do retrograde, but I don't know. That doesn't really make any sense to me. Yeah, I, 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 I had somebody say this to, to somebody I heard not too long ago. They said, well, I don't use a NEARS uh, on my patients because, you know, it, it tells me to run higher CO2s on my cases and, um, and it opens up the cerebral vasculature. And I don't want to, I, I think it's a higher risk of, of, of perfusing higher microemboli to the brain. And so I just, okay, so let me just ask you a question. Are we pumping microemboli in the first place? Because if, if you're at cold temperatures and you're in a low flow, we forget about alpha stat, pH, pH stat, or running a, a, a NEARS on your patient. If you're at low flow because you're cool and then you go up to a higher flow because you're warm, how is that any different than doing a little bit higher flow when you're cold in the first place? Why are you saying there's a higher risk of microemboli just because you have a, a more dilated cerebral vasculature well, I mean, and, you're, and you're flowing more? No, I think you're flowing yeah. more when you're warm. I mean, anyway. I, I do. Yes, that's true. Of course. I mean, I agree with you. But I mean, I do think that we we are um, as a general rule, uh, we do expel uh, gases microemboli from the from the pump on a routine basis. I think we know that. Um, I don't think, I think it's accepted, but I don't necessarily know that there's any, any, any clinical relevance to it. I, mm -hmm. I don't think that would be the reason. I think the risk benefit scale would be imbalanced towards higher uh, risk, less benefit to constrict the cerebral blood vessels and perfuse the brain with an inadequate amount of oxygenated blood that would still even have microemboli in it, just at a lesser quantity. Uh, than you would have if you had good flow, what it needed, and possibly even luxurious flow. My caveat to that is I think if you have luxurious flow, you really have to be very careful, and I think you have to be this anyway, about maintaining uh, your, uh, your COP and maintaining your, uh, your, your fluid compartment volumes uh, accurately. Uh, although a little bit drier is always in my view way better than a little bit of edema. i don't think edema is ever good 
right. you know, clearly, you know, tissue dehydration to a point is, is bad too, but you would rather have a little drier environment. Uh, I think it's gonna perfuse better. You're gonna get better microcapillary uh, perfusion. Yeah, um, I think we got a lot bigger fish to fry than worry about if our flow is a little bit higher and uh, we, we're somehow pumping uh, micro micro air emboli anyway. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to ask you a question back on your your presentation as well. When you're doing retrograde cerebral perfusion, um, are you still running a one or two percent on your sevoflurane? Yeah, I'll put it you, down to about a half a percent. Oh, you turn it way down. Okay. Yeah, I'll run it about a half a percent to one percent. Yeah, I'll turn it down because the metabolism is going to be a lot slow. You know, there's going to be, you know, I don't even know that it has any value, but I will leave it on at, at a lower level, but I will leave it on. Well, what about if your COP, you're, you're doing retrograde cerebral and your COP is low and you, you, uh, you want to add, uh, you want to add some albumin or something. Are you going to add albumin to your reservoir at that low of a flow and it's all going to go to the brain or, or what are you going to do about that exactly no i'm not gonna i'm not gonna i'm gonna tune it up and have it the way i want it before we start that procedure and then at that point in time i'm not going to give any agent unless it's a a, a neuroprotective agent that we want to give for some reason uh and our, you know whatever uh, they want if they wanted to give some more pentothal usually they don't but if they wanted to give something, uh, we could do that if it's directly, they want it to go directly into the brain. At that point, I'm not gonna give any mannitol, I'm not gonna give any albumin, I'm not gonna, certainly not gonna give any neo. Uh, if there's any pressure uh, that I'm not happy with, I'm going to just increase the flow, is how I'm gonna manage it. Increase or decrease the flow within certain tolerances. I'm not gonna go below a certain flow, but I'm also not gonna go above a certain flow. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to try to figure out why is this happening? And certainly it could be CO2, but generally speaking, you know, I would say the cases have been pretty consistently easy. You know, if you have everything squared away the way you want it, and then you go on circa rest, the COP isn't going to change. Yeah. You know, yeah. no, you, you had a slide, you had a slide when you talked about it. And I almost got the impression that you were, but I misunderstood your your slide then. I, I, I had the impression that... No, I think you need to you check have for blood gases and electrolytes to see there. if anything is changing. Yeah. So you, yeah. you want to know, you know, you want to look and see if you have, uh, you want to make sure that your, your PO2, your PCO2 is where you want it to be. Your pH is where you want it to be. Um, of course, I like them all to be normal values, which is abnormal at that temperature. I recognize that, but that's what I want. Mm -hmm. I want it to be, so I want it to be non-corrected, normal values at the temperature where I am. Right. So whichever you, one that is, I guess that's pH you, stat. I'm assuming that's pH stat by now. I think I got it right. Uh, I think I, you're doing alpha stat. Yeah, you're, okay, you're it's alpha using, stat. You, are you using what the, uh, what the blood gas people send you back? You're using that result they send no, you back? No, I use it corrected to the temperature that oh. I am. Oh, then that's pH stat, yeah? Yeah, that's what I want. I want it to be, I want it to be 74040 at the temperature I am, not, not what it would be if the patient was uh, 37. Okay, so you have a, a, a very nicely vasodilated brain, and that's probably why you're able to flow and perfuse extremely well, because you have the normal uh, content of CO2, um, that is for at that temperature is 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 a lot of CO2 because so much so much of it is dissolved now at that temperature mm -hmm. and you have a, a, a um, over overwhelmed and overridden your cerebral regulation regu regulation which which is the point a lot of people purposely want to do that because of how you're doing it and you're going to have luxurious cerebral flow that that's for sure right but I do want to spot check even though. I know it's not going to change. I think it just helps me with validating. I want to make sure that the, 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 the crit is where I want it. For example, when we do, when I do deep hypothermia circulatory arrest, I'll let the crit go down, all mm -hmm. the, the hematocrit down to 16, mm -hmm. doesn't bother me, 14 won't bother me. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll, what I'll do is I will drain blood out of the patient into a bag and replace it 
usually I like to use bicarb based fluids like the Duosol or whatever Prismasol or whatever there, there is out there. There's a lot of them out there that they use in the dialysis world that they use for CRRT. I like to use that fluid. You know, it's bicarb based. I don't dilute anything out. So I'll pull whole blood off and then I'll dilute the crit down to overwhelm or, or to manage the increased viscosity that I know is going to happen and we have good flow. Then when we're warming the patient, as we're warming it increments along the way, I'll add that blood back and ultra filtrate off and add that blood back and ultra filtrate off. And I've done that with, with up to two liters of blood and uh, give it back in 500 cc aliquots. And uh, by the time I come off, we have a hematocrit that's back up to about 30 and uh, maybe 26. If it's lower than that, we're certainly gonna transfuse um, and uh, uh, come off pump. All that sounds extremely familiar, actually. It's extremely familiar. I, I think uh, when you get really cold like that, it's, it's pretty wise to be pretty diluted because you know what's going on with the viscosity. In fact, one of your slides showed that, didn't it? Yes. Not? Well, well you're, how the you're really going to have a hard time perfusing the microcirculation, even in the mm -hmm. brain, when you have that high of viscosity. Um, and the red cell, you know, deformability is also compromised to some degree. So if you have yeah. a, too many, too much, you can really almost create a dam in some of these capillary beds that are not going to come back until you warm. So that could still happen, but I think it's going to happen to a lesser degree if you are much more hemodiluted, much fewer red blood. So your red cell volume is, is significantly decreased. That's what I yeah, believe. Yeah. It is going to make it a little bit more slippery to get through them capillaries, hopefully. But I wanted to ask you something else, too. When you resume full bypass and you're at 17 or 18 degrees, do you stay at that temperature for a period of time before you, like, you stay at 18 degrees for 10 minutes, then you begin the rewarming? Or do you, how, how much time do you stay? Ten, at least 10 minutes. So it, I'm going to go, at, yes, when we restart from, from circa rest, uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to keep the, I will put the heater cooler on 18, keep it at 18 degrees. In fact, I keep it at 18 degrees while mm -hmm. I'm perfusing the selective, mm -hmm. uh, the isolated cerebral perfusion. I don't, I want to keep that brain at the temperature we meant it to be. And then once we've recreated, they've done the proximal portion of the anastomosis, we've transitioned back to normal flow. Um, we've taken the tape off the superior vena cava. Uh, catheter that I've been using for the retrograde and get good drainage. And that's why I like that big, that big line, because now I'm going to turn my flow up and I'm going to give this patient just a really nice, normal blood flow uh, at an index of two to 2.2, somewhere in that range, even at 18 degrees for 10 minutes. And then mm -hmm. I'm going to turn my uh, 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 temperature up to the appropriate level for rewarming at the rate that I want to uh, rewarm keep that gradient at 10 degrees or less. Yeah, that's excellent. That's what I do. And I mm -hmm. have, look, I've had really good, listen, man, I've done, I, like I said, I've done a couple of, I haven't done one of these cases in a while now, but I mean, of the last, you know, 10, 15, 20, I guess, that I've done, um, they've all done great. And, you know, mm -hmm. we had good surgeons. They, they weren't, they weren't like super fast. They weren't like big time aortic surgeons. These were, these were regular kind of guys that did cabbages, valves, things like that. No, they were pretty talented. They were good. They were good surgeons. Um, but, uh, but all of the patients did remark, just really did well. And uh, I think that the way I did it, the way I was able to, because I worked in a place that they really sort of just look, deferred to us and, and if it made sense to them, they were good with it and the outcomes were good. So there was never there, you know, why, what's there to complain about, right? It's all about the outcomes at the end of the day. You're only as good as your last right decision. That's, that's the nature of this business. So when people give you autonomy, when they're, especially when they are, 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 are from, a, from a positional perspective, a rank perspective, higher rank than you, and they give you autonomy, in the case, in this case, surgeons and perfusionists, um, we may be colleagues, but you know we're the lieutenants and they're the colonels. So you know you have to, or general, and we're the whatever majors. However you want to couch this, doesn't make any difference. You're only going to be as good as your last right decision. And so 
having autonomy is a great thing and being respected as a professional is a great thing and having people listen to your opinion and value it and follow the suggestions you're giving is a great thing, but it comes with an enormous burden and responsibility that you can't take too lightly because we're dealing with people and their life, their brain. That's, this is a serious business. And I think sometimes um, that's not always remembered. And, uh, and, and I don't mean that in a negative way to knock Perfusion. I think Perfusion is a wonderful profession. I think there, I have some incredibly talented, look, look at you. I've got, we've got some incredibly talented, caring, uh, professional colleagues, a lot of them out there, okay? The overwhelming majority, for sure. Uh, but we don't see these people. We don't talk to the patient beforehand. We don't get to know their family beforehand. We don't see them post-operatively that, you know, or, or, or rarely do we. We don't see them on the follow-up visits. We don't have that connection. And sometimes I think we lose sight of, you know, how truly important our jobs really are. What we do is meaningful. And uh, you well, got it, but you got to be right. You can't, you can't, you, you, you can't, this isn't, you can't do guesswork. You got to do your research. You have to have a foundation for why you're doing what you're doing. And uh, you know what? It's got to be, a, it's got to, if, if something goes awry and doesn't work out well, it's not because you did something wrong. I think that's really the point. Knowing, you know, we're, you ever, through a lack of, through a lack of knowledge. Have you ever seriously ask yourself this question what if as perfusionists we had to talk with the family every family after every case we would we had to go and talk with the family that was part of our job mm -hmm. would that not turn your uh perspective of what we do on its head if you had to talk with every family that we did that would you it, that you bumped? would it turn my perspective on its head probably not but I think it would be a, I think it would, I think it would, I think it would help to reinforce because I, like I said, I think the overwhelming majority of the people that we work with, you know, we, we are sort of in the background, we're kind of quiet, we're there. N nobody really knows what the heck we're doing back there. You know, that it's just, a, it's, it's an, it's almost like it's an enigma. It's really strange. Um, and it's, but it has profound impact. So I think it would, I think it would benefit us as a profession if we did that, but I don't necessarily think it's necessary. I think we can, you know, we, we can be sensitive to that without actually talking with the patient. I just think that we need to be more keenly aware of the need to be sensitive to it because you can get to the point where eh, it's just another case, you know, uh, right. They got a bump in their creatinine. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, we've all been there. We've been, especially you've been doing this for any length of time. We, you know, I've had my moment. I've had my time in this profession of, you know, going through the motions. Um, but, uh, but you know, uh, I think by and large, I recognize that what we do um, matters tremendously to people, and that. Uh, uh, th not just living through the operation, but being a normal functioning, the same person they were when they came in uh, for them and their families really matter, really matters. Well, well that's what I mean. We would see, you know, an awful lot of good, may, might even be more gratifying. We would see the people who just had, you know, uh, the temporary, you know, a pump head, as they used to call it. We'd see people that had, you know, some slight permanent, deficits like their their short-term memory just wasn't nearly as is what it once was and then mm -hmm. we would see the things that maybe are more serious but we're we're probably 95 percent or more blinded to especially the long term we don't see patients in the long term ever and a lot of people don't even hardly go over to check on their patients in the icu mm -hmm. anymore we used to do that Every morning you'd go see your patient from the previous day mm -hmm. and just ask the nurse how they did and mm -hmm. you might even do it on the second day, but after that. But do we really know what the patient comes back into the doctor's office 30, 60 days later and six months later and, and you know, we, we were totally unaware and, and we probably had a big role in, in a lot of what these patients experienced, good and bad. Yeah, absolutely. 
Well, I'm going to argue with you about one thing. Pump head is not caused by the pump. It's called by, caused by the surgeon. Don't forget that. Yeah. Um, I want to I want to say something though, Pedro, um, Pedro Lucas. I, I'm going to send I'm going to send you a messenger uh, thing. He said uh, to us, "Excellent once again. It's 1 a.m. here, and I'm watching you guys. This means something. Congratulations, Pedro. Thank you very much. That's 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 kind and generous of you, and we appreciate those kinds of comments. And also, um, I can't pronounce this name, so forgive me. I'm trying to make it simple as I can during DHCA. I think that makes a lot of sense, Raf." Um, I think keeping it simple does make it make sense. And for me, the simplest approach is to put that bridge from the arterial to venous line, clamp uh, proximal to the oxygenator, and clamp the uh, inferior vena cable line, atrial vena cable line, and just pump straight up there, go retrograde through a 22 French, make sure the tapes are on, flow a good flow, use TCD. It sounds like it complicates things, but it's gonna make you feel a lot better about what you're doing. I just wish it would become more of a standard of care. John, you want to close up with any closing remarks? Well, I, I actually um, when you wanted to ask you about the TCD because I remember years ago, didn't you? Didn't we used to monitor the middle cerebral artery? Isn't that what the TCD aim you aim it towards? It does, and you 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 look at them bilaterally, um, and you can you can you can visualize both of them. Um, okay. you can, yes, you can visualize both from one side. You can actually see through to the other side, have oh. two, cha but they have two channels. Uh, I, I would have to, t we'd need to get Dr. Garami back here to do this because he really know, understands it way better than I do. Um, but Bob Groom talked about it for years. No, yeah. it's not really a, uh, it's really never been widely adapted into the, uh, cardiovascular world. And a lot of the reason for that is because it, there, there's new device, a new device out that is automated. It's like a robot, but it occupies a lot of, a lot of, of, of geography up here. And you, you know how anesthesia is about stuff. Um, but the old style, you had to get it up there and you had to aim it and you had to get it set. And, uh, but then once it's set, as long as nobody hits it, you're not going to have any problems. It'll stay where it needs to be. It's kind of a, a headband that goes on with the probes here in the, uh, you know, in the temp what they call the temporal window area. Um, right. But you can also put it in the carotids. You can, you know, you can, you can put it up like this. Uh, you can do eyeball. Um, there's other ways to do it, to view other things. But again, that takes a little more expertise. This, the temporal window uh, v v version right. is very simple. Well, hasn't a version of it been around for many, many years? Because I did a paper back, I want to say, in 1989, I had a case report. Surgeon came to me and said, look, we've got this patient. He has bilateral 100% total occlusions of the carotids, and this is not going to be a carotid arterectomy. It's too way too late for that. The patient is actually relatively fine. He, he, he had some dizzy spells and things like that, but he didn't actually stroke out. He was surviving on his vertebral arteries and collaterals that had developed apparently over the years, but we were gonna put this patient with 100% total parotid stenosis on bypass, and we had the idea of creating a pulsatile flow with the balloon pump. We actually put a balloon pump catheter in this patient for the purpose of pulsatile flow, and we did a middle cerebral artery. I wanna say it was a TCD, but it was a single probe. I think we put it near the temporal area, and we got a great visual of the entire case that we were perfusing the brain, and this patient did extremely well. well you were way ahead. Of, you were way ahead of the curve then, John, because it is not yep. widely accepted. And I really, like I said, want it to be. We, um, uh, please help me. I'm going to get you. I think you might have Dr. Garami's email address. We need to send him an email, and we need to get him scheduled to come back here. He's been here once before, and do a review on it again for us and really talk about the simplicity. Talk about it from an actual making it happen perspective. Um, maybe do two parts. Do one about the value of it and do one about the, how do you do it, do it, you know, just the directions, the recipe, and how do, you, how do we overcome this, 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 this never ending turf war that exists almost everywhere I have ever been between anesthesia and anybody else that gets up in their in their zone because it's not 
it's it's not beneficial. We all have we're all there for the same purpose. So I never really mm. understood that. Now it doesn't happen with every everybody. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of anesthetists who are really kind of cool and they yeah sure you know we'll do this. I'm you know referring more to towards the uh, towards the MD anesthesia that seemed to have uh, difficulty with anybody doing anything like that. So you're you're proposing that it should be done on all your circulatory arrest cases. I think it should least. be done on every case that on goes on bypass. Case. I think it should be done on every off pump case. I think it should be done routinely on any case where you're screwing around with the cardiovascular system and have episodes of hypoperfusion. You know, could you imagine doing a doing a doing putting a putting a stabilizer on the heart, pulling the heart over with that suction that they put on the apex and lifting the heart up to get the circ or the OM and anesthesia is over there, bam, 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 bam. And you've got this great looking blood pressure, but you're doing a TCD and you literally have no cerebral blood flow. Oh, yeah. So, or <laughs> trickling. So, you know, I mean, how many times does that happen? And we don't know it. And then everybody wonders, why did this patient have a neurologic consequence? What happened here? Some type of event happened, but what was it? We had a great blood pressure the whole time. Blood pressure, I said it the other day, blood pressure yep. and perfusion are not equal. They're not the same thing. I can give you a great blood pressure with a, with a cardiac output of one liter a minute. I can make your blood pressure look fantastic. Right. So I was going to call on that. that. That was a good, that was a good show. I think it was yesterday. Was it? I, uh, I, 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 that was a great, you, you, when, you know, pressure equals flow times resistance. So you could have a very, very high resistance and a tiny, tiny flow and your pressure looks great. You know, we, we focus way too much on numbers. And if the numbers are good, that means everything must be okay. That, that, you have to look at the patient and you have to think about the physiology and the anatomy of what are we doing right at this moment in time to this patient. And does it make sense? Absolutely. You know? And looking at the flow, seeing it on a monitor, the actual flow, the velocity, right. the perfusion. I mean, yes, we're there to perfuse the whole body, but you know, the brain, it's like the big deal. You know, the brain is the most sensitive organ of all to hypoperfusion. And we, 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 we use these stickers on the head that supposedly look through skin, tissue, fluids, bone, um, and everything else to get to the brain. Does it really get to the brain? You know, it's a, it's a debate that's going to rage on forever, but I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't think it does, but John, we're, we've run out of time. I hate to do this to uh, you, but we've run out of time. I need to tell everybody that we will see you tomorrow. Uh, John, you're going to be back tomorrow. As a matter of fact, tomorrow you are going to be talking about roller versus centrifugal pumps. I can't believe there are still people that use roller pumps, but I'm fascinated by that topic. And I'm going to be talking about basically measurement of how do we measure the adequacy of our perfusion? And it's pretty basic. I think it's going to be pretty simple, uh, but it'll be fun. We'll make it enjoyable. I'm looking forward to hearing your talk. And then we're going to do just a 20 minute back and forth on what is perfusion? Is it a career or a job? And I think we've already laid the groundwork for that here tonight, John. So, uh, so we'll see you tomorrow. Same time, same station. Thanks right. a lot. Peace out. Later. Be safe. Take care, guys. You too. Mix cannulae, expanding performance standards. High performance cannulae for direct and femoral cannulation in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Levanova's complete range of mix dedicated products allow easy and reproducible procedures. The portfolio includes the sutureless aortic valve Percival. Memo 4D for mitral valve repair. The HeartLink system for assisting the perfusionist in applying goal-directed perfusion therapy. And a broad choice of high-performance dedicated cannulae. Leva Nova's range of cannulae suit every cannulation technique for minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Venous and arterial femoral cannulation can be performed using the wrap venous cannula and the Easy Flow Duo. For arterial direct and venous femoral cannulation, the Easy Flow aortic cannula and the wrap are available. 
For venous femoral access, the Levanova Wrap Cannula features a dual-stage configuration for optimal drainage of the inferior and superior vena cava without interfering with the right atrium. The high flow dynamics of wrap improves the capability of drainage with a low pressure drop. An optional Selinger dilator kit is available to perform percutaneous insertion. The Levanova Easy Flow Duo Cannula is designed for a safe and smooth femoral arterial cannulation. Its conical dispersion tip design allows a more gentle flow in the femoral artery, and its red cap avoids blood backflow during obturator removal. A dilator kit for percutaneous insertion is also included with the cannula. Easy Flow cannulae are designed for safe, reproducible, direct aortic cannulation and include a malleable stylet to aid cannulation insertion, facilitating bloodless introduction into the aortic arch, as well as a special conical dispersion tip for a more gentle flow in the vessel to reduce shear stress. The point of care program at Huntsville Hospital is approaching its 20 year anniversary. As we began to grow as a hospital and provide more complex services to our community, the need for point of care testing became very clear in our organization. Many of our departments consider the EPOT device to be crucial to their ability to quickly move their patients from entry to the hospital to procedural room. It helps them monitor the patient's status during their procedures and post procedures. So it's very integrated into our entire continuum of patient care. If you have any patient population where blood management is crucial, then a point of care device is very useful in those types of settings. It can provide a quick result on a very small amount of blood and, and that is really important in some of our patient population. We are starting a new process where we're gonna screen our patients on the floor for sepsis. The patient can look and, and actually feel okay. They will show us signs and symptoms of sepsis. So what we do when they show these signs, we get a lactate level. Lactic acid is a, a product of the sepsis cascade. So with sepsis, the inflammatory light switch goes on, the cascade starts churning, and unfortunately, once it starts going, we have to stop it. It will not stop on its own. The faster the lab draw, the faster the lab results, the faster you can, you can act on it. The process in the lab is what the process is. It just takes a certain amount of time for the instruments to run those tests. I mean, we're talking 30 minutes even on a stat because that's the process. You, this is how long it takes. There's not really anything you can do about that. For every hour you wait to give an antibiotic, the mortality for that patient increases 8%. So now that we have the handheld device, the nurse can get those results within a few minutes and we know how to treat that patient. If a patient is going into septic shock, we do not have minutes to spare. We have got to get it done quickly. So when you get the little beep from the epoch that says your results are in, you're, you go with it. You don't even think twice about it. You're like, this is, this is good. This is what I'm gonna do for this patient. The next steps are clear. I think our mortality on the, the initial floors dropped by almost 50% in the first three to six months. At this point, we are about hospital-wide. I think we'll be hospital-wide another two to four months. So this has become a huge program uh, within our, our system. Without the EPOC device, it would really be hard for us to get everything done in the timely manner. So it's really helped us to get our program going. I mean, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a medicine doctor, whether you're a dermatologist, you want to be able to do things in a timely fashion so that you can be most effective. This really makes a difference in patient outcomes. Like all perfusion professionals today, we are busy and frequently short-staffed. Does taking time off for a conference create a burden for your teammates? Has reimbursement for your continuing education dropped? Have you priced the cost of going to a meeting lately? Registration fees, airfare, transportation and parking? 
hotel, and meals out, this totals up to having an out-of-pocket expense of over $2,500. And then you hope the content is good. Perfusion Education has heard your concerns. They have a simple and seamless system that works on any platform, computer, tablet, or even your phone. You can chat during the program or even phone in and be live on the air. The content, second to none. Perfusion Education is by Perfusionist and for Perfusionist. Create a free account and check us out today.